Good afternoon. Welcome to our online lecture number seven. Today, we will talk about macroeconomic aggregates and global inequality. So let's get started. So today's lecture will be an introduction to macro. We'll talk about the most important measurement that we have, the gross domestic product. Then we'll talk about some national income accounting because we will deal with a measurement a lot. And then we will talk about the measurement flows, some things about inequality and some things about productivity. Today is going to be a very easy lecture for everyone to follow. So most of the things that we will talk about, they are straightforward. We'll just have to put everything in the right order. Let's start with introduction to macroeconomics. So macroeconomics is the, the branch of economics that follows to the economy as a whole, to not economic units separately, but to economy as a whole. So macroeconomics is the study of the aggregate economic activity. So again, we will quit dealing with each unit separately now, and we're going to start dealing with the aggregates. Macroeconomics is uh, a relatively new field. So it's uh, the study of economics in the previous years uh, before the uh, 18th century, it was dealing mainly with sociological issues of the economy, and the branches of economics were not, uh, have not yet been separated to uh, micro and macroeconomics. So before the 1915, the aggregate economic activity was measured indirectly through some proxy variables. So the Economists back then, they did not have the ability, the scientists did not have the tools in order to be able to measure how much is the total production, the total unemployment, the total price level, the inflation rate, and all this. So they didn't have the necessary scientific tools to do that. So they would use some smart methods, some proxy variables, like, for example, transportation tonnage. Transportation tonnage was how much was transferred with trains, how much was transferred by, by ships. And with these variables, they would use also some statistical extrapolation, and they will try to figure out how much the total production of the economy was. After uh, some time, we started developing very sophisticated systems. And today, in the modern macroeconomics, we almost know these variables in real time. So we have accounting systems and technology and sophisticated statistical models that they help us estimate all the macroeconomic variables in a basis of almost weekly, in some other variables daily, and in some other variables, as we will see in a few lectures in the money market, you can have a real-time estimate of what happens in the entire economy. In this lecture, I want to explore the measurement of the aggregate economic ability, the aggregate economic uh, activity, and the aggregate economic spending, expenditure, production, earnings, all these aggregate things. And then we want to examine why those variables differ from country to country. And we will focus today especially in the total production. Total production will be our main focus. Also, in next lectures, we will talk about the differences in, those ver in other variables, like, for example, the differences in unemployment, the differences in inflation, and all these other differences between countries to countries and between from time to time also. But today, we'll focus mostly on the total production, on the aggregate production of the economy. All right, so there are income differences. And macroeconomics is interested in the enormous income differences across countries, but also across time. So, uh, for example, you can say that the income that we have today in Singapore, the national income of Singapore, let's say, it's vastly different than the income that Singaporeans had in the 1960s. Okay, we're talking about a vast difference. And even in other economies that they did not have such abrupt growth like uh, Singapore, you will see, like, for example, in the United States that traditionally is a wealthy economy, you will see that even 100 years ago, the income was vastly different than the income that they have today. So income per capita in Singapore is more than six times the level of Russia. Uh, 
two of the countries that they have lived, uh, Singapore and Russia, they have vastly different economic ability, the two countries, economic potential. Okay, so you see that uh, Russia is actually a much poorer country than Singapore is. Well, this is a, a discussion that we have to, to start here because in total, Russia is a vastly uh, a big country, one or other, uh, not one, the biggest country on earth, I think. Uh, if I remember correctly, it has a 20% of land in, uh, on the planet is, is Russia or something like that. It's pretty close if it's not that number. And uh, we're talking about uh, a situation where the average Singaporean has six times the income of the average Russian, however. Even though the Russian economy is much bigger in total, the average person is much more wealthy in Singapore than it is in, uh, in Russia. And this is something very interesting that we have to discuss. Income per capita in Greece today is 35% lower than it used to be 12 years ago. And this is something that perhaps you have heard in the news or uh, read in the newspaper or something that uh, Greece went through a, a major crisis. And we'll talk about it extensively in today's lecture and some other lectures uh, later on. And you will see that uh, the income in most countries has a tendency to increase in that particular country. For that particular time, the income went down for a lot. It was a, it was a consistent trend for income to go down. And that's another interesting thing. So there are many interesting questions to ask. First of all, what brings prosperity and what brings crisis? What makes a nation's income to grow and what causes it to shrink? How do we measure the cross-country economic differences? Measurement is not easy because you have many, many factors that they are different. Remember when we said we have to apply the Ceteris Paribus principle, like only one thing changes if we want to understand causation there. So if you want to measure something, you have to make sure that you normalize all other factors. And this is not easy. We are going to deal with that. What causes the differences in income levels and trends? So what is the co causative factor now that makes some countries' income to have a positive trend, some other countries to have a negative trend for some time, and what causes these uh, different levels? Like, for example, why in Switzerland people are so wealthy and in uh, uh, the Dominican Republic they are not that, that wealthy? Okay, so we have to understand what causes these differences. And finally, what is the forecast? What is the outlook of different economies? Will these differences actually converge at some point? Or they we will keep deviating? So this is another very interesting question that macroeconomists are very interested on. So it's not easy, as it seems. Uh, for example, China has been catching up with the United States very quickly. And we go to a point that we say now that is China going to become a much bigger economy than the United States? Is it going to become the by far biggest economy on earth like the United States used to be a few years ago? So this is an interesting question because uh, what we see here is that uh, China is growing four times as fast as the US for a period of, of 30 years. So China started from a very low income per capita and the United States already had a very high income per capita. But we see that China is growing faster than the United States, uh, uh, how the United States is growing. And uh, this is interesting because if something is smaller than something else, but it grows at a faster rate, this means that at some point in time, it will catch up and will surpass. The, the smaller thing that grows faster will become bigger than a larger things that grows slower. At some point, they will cross paths and, and then they will start deviating and the ones that was smaller before, now it will become larger. So this is an interesting story to, to look for. Will China surpass the United States or something else will happen? And this is, not, this is a question like, for example, what can happen that can slow down China while the US will keep going up? This is an interesting question to ask. And if you want to answer questions like that, 
The best thing you can do is look what happened before. The history here, the economic history, has to teach you amazing lessons that you can use for the future to understand what is going on. We have seen this movie, again, exactly the same thing. We have seen it before. Like, for example, Japan's income was about to overtake the US's income in the 90s. So in the 1990s, the situation was like that. So um, you have years in the horizontal axis, and then you have the income, the income per capita for these two countries, and USA is blue, and Japan is red, and they were going something like that. So a lot of economists, they saw this trend, and they said, okay, so in the 90s, at some point, what we're going to see is that Japan is definitely going to surpass the United States, and it will become the largest economy on the planet. And this was something that uh, I was a kid back then, but I still remember that people were saying, like the, the uh, grown-ups were saying, oh, now forget about the US and Soviet Union also. Now it's going to be all about Japan. And people were driving Japanese cars. Uh, they were listening to music into little Sony uh, 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 radios that they were back then the best of the best and the most expensive. And uh, it was something that you would see around you. Okay, you would see that the growth of, of Japan, it was something that you could see in Greece, that uh, back then, of course, with the limited information, we had never even seen how Japan looked that, that much. So, but however, you could see this uh, result of growing even in a country very, very far away, and even for a kid, me back then, to be able to observe that. But what happened in the end? Well, it surpassed it for a little bit, just briefly, and depending on which measurement, how you translate the values and everything. So they were very close for some time, but then we saw that this actually never happened. So almost 30 years later, the US is still ahead than the Japan. So it's not as easy as, as, as it sounds. It's not as easy as just taking a mathematical value that is small but grows faster and another mathematical value that is bigger but grows slower and you know that at some point they, they will converge. Here you have to do with two uh, live organisms that things happen and uh, economists moreover have observed that growth rates, they tend to slow down as income per capita rises. This is very interesting because it seems, and we will see exactly this theory in a couple of lectures, it seems as if there is something like a potential for an economy. And when the economy reaches this potential, as it approaches its full potential, it slows down and slows and slows and slows, so it will reach this potential kind of smoothly and then stay there. Economists call this point the steady state, and we will see exactly the model that shows us a very simple form of a steady state a little later, not, not today, in a couple of lectures. But for now, you have to understand that, okay, so you grow, but at some point, depending on the kind of growth you have, maybe this is not going to be a growth that will be sustainable for uh, much longer. Okay, so there are very interesting questions to understand about macroeconomics and to give answers to very intriguing and puzzling problems that we have. Another thing that we will be concerned with a lot is what happens with policy. We have already seen in uh, the microeconomics level that if you take a market, a monopoly, let's say, and you regulate it, you can actually decrease the dead weight loss. So, so the regulator can actually have a real effect on the market, not just a nominal one, just not just an effect on the numbers, an effect in what is really going on in this market. Uh, we have seen that if you want to regulate, for example, a perfectly competitive market, then you may increase the inefficiency in this market, but yet you will be able to alter the price level one way or another, okay, with the price ceiling, or with a price floor, and all these things that we have seen. So there are many other ways to doing policy in, for a market, but in general, what happens when you want to do policy for the entire economy, so macroeconomic policy now? At the macroeconomic level, policy works too. 
policy is debated how it works, but we have seen that it has results. Uh, macro in general is not as clear cut as microeconomics is. But still, we can observe in a statistic, with a statistical method, with statistical tools, we can observe how this economy responds to policy. But there are two levels of policy. First of all, you have growth policy. This is a long-run policy that targets to augment this potential size of the, of the economy. So you can actually have a growth policy uh, like Singapore does for the last uh, 60 years and keeps growing. This is, uh, this is a result of the growth policies. And then you can have stabilization policies that these are policies that they do not target the long run potential of the economy, but they target if, for example, imagine the economy that is going up like that, the the way that you go up is not, it doesn't look smooth like that. If you look at the short-run data, you will see that the real economy goes up and down, goes through recessions, through, through expansions. It doesn't seem like a, a flat, straight path towards uh, development. So what you want to do in the short run is you want to limit these ups and downs. You want to, to smoothen them up so they will, they, they will not affect the households and the firms in a bad way. So there are policies that they target to augment the economy. These are the long-run policies. And then there are the short-run policies that they target to shorten the recessions, to alleviate the short-run unemployment, to make the path towards the long-run equilibrium, let's say, to make it a little bit smoother. On the other hand, you can have corruption, or you can have sloppy policy. Like, for example, you have, let's say, a president, uh, uh, like any president can be, black, white, orange, I don't know. And uh, this president, for example, decides to implement some tariffs for trade. Okay, and these tariffs for trade, they actually make it so the foreign producers will not be able to export materials in your country. And you hope with that, that domestic production will actually have a time to develop because now the, the imports from other countries are not that easy. But then your producers are like, um, hey, president, you know, we're making cars here. And then you put tariffs on steel and that makes our cost of materials more expensive. Uh, so you can have sloppy policies that they will, uh, instead of helping the economy, they will actually condemn it to a, to a much lower uh, potential than what it would actually have. Uh, so one of the basic concerns of the macroeconomics is how these bad policies can be avoided in the future. And macroeconomics, much more than microeconomics. Microeconomics is very technical, very mathematical, very concrete. Macroeconomics is a little bit uh, more flexible, more creative. It's a little bit more um, open-ended science, a branch of the same science, actually, because something that works today may not work tomorrow because the economy changes all the time. And in, uh, in microeconomics, it's very easy when you change one variable to have all the other variables constant. But you cannot go to the economy and say, hey, uh, the, you guys in the entire economy, just stop what you're doing, so we'll try to see how this policy works. Okay, you cannot do that. So it's much more difficult and open-ended to understand what are the results of an economic shock that affects the macroeconomy in what way. Okay, so it's not very easy to understand that. So one of the basic concerns in macroeconomics is if you have a bad policy, to learn from it and to not repeat it in the future. Like, for example, when we had the crisis in 2007, this crisis, it was a very deep crisis that went by very quickly, at least for the United States, because the economies that handled the situation back then, uh, especially Ben Bernanke uh, and the, uh, 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 Timothy Gardner, the Minister of Economics in, in the US, they had learned very well the lessons that the Great Depression of 1929 had taught economists, all right? And we will talk about that just about now. So the period from 2007 to 2009 signified 
the world financial crisis. So what happened is that the macroeconomics, how I learned them, that I was a student of, I, I took this class, this specific class, before 2007 is vastly different than it is today after the 2007. And let me share with you a very brief story. When I was in graduate school in 2004, I think, I had to select what I'm going to do my research on, what I'm going to write my thesis on. And I, was, uh, I wanted to write on a, a microeconomic concept because I always like things that they are concrete, that there's no room for disagreement much. So once you discover something, it's very easy to convince everybody because if the math works, you are home free. But I had some friends that, uh, I don't know why, they wanted to do macro. And one of my friends, uh, she came to me and, said, and we had this discussion. I told her what I'm going to do. And she said, I want to do financial crisis. And I heard to her 2004, summer of 2004, I heard to her and I was like, financial crisis. Why, why is that important? Why the last, the last financial crisis we had was 80 years ago. Why do you want to do your career on something that uh, is not, is not going to happen again. And uh, one day we wake up in 2007 and we hear that several huge banks that we thought that they last forever, they just went out of business and now they, uh, the whole economic, uh, uh, economic environment is crumbling everywhere in the planet. Okay, so back in the beginning of 2000, macroeconomics, how I was taught, they were very different than they are today because you have very different society that you live in. So the US economy shrank by 4.3% and the unemployment rate rose from 5% up to 10%. Now, at the time that I'm filming this lecture, we are in the middle of the pandemic COVID-19 crisis in 2020, and we do not know exactly how the crisis of 2007 compares to the crisis when we reach the bottom uh, of, of the COVID-19 situation. So the data that we have now, they are for the pre-COVID-19 situation, and uh, we will talk about that reality and compare it to what happened in the crisis. So 10% unemployment for the United States 10% persistent unemployment is a phenomenon that is life-changing for the society. This is deeply concerning for the United States. In Greece, if somebody was able to take unemployment to 10%, this person would win the elections very easily the next time. Because unemployment now in Greece is something like 19%, which is an achievement for the previous government because it took it down from 24 to 19. And this is something that they, they presented it as, as it was a, an amazing thing that they did. So the numbers from country to country may have different meaning for many social reasons. Like for example, in the United States, if you are 22, 23, after college uh, age person, uh, this means that if you are unemployed for a long time, you automatically become homeless. There is nobody else to help you. In Greece, you have somebody who is losing their job when they are 35 years old. Uh, they will be like, hey, mom, I'm moving back. And, and his mom will be like, oh, sure, when are you coming? Good, yes, come back. Okay, so the society is very different, can tolerate the safety net, the social safety net of the society is very different, for example, in Southern Europe and in uh, some Latin countries than it is in the United States. In the United States, you call, uh, you call your mama, hey, mom, I lost my job, and your mom is like, uh, okay, and what are you gonna do now? Okay, so there's very different social norms that make also the numbers to be interpreted very uh, differently. So 10% unemployment for the United States is catastrophic. So meanwhile, this was not the bad part of the story. The worst was that the chain of contagion started towards the rest of the world and especially towards Europe. Uh, stock market crashes, collapsing housing prices, mortgage defaults, 
entire banks failed, that they, uh, you thought that they will never fail, and all this. And especially Greece, Cyprus, Ireland, and Portugal, they were the weak links of this chain of countries in the European Union. They had the weakest economy. And when they were under pressure, when the chain is under pressure, the weak links are the ones that they are going to break first. So the contagion hit these uh, four economies particularly hard. And you had what I said before, that in Greece income plummeted. Okay, like, for example, my parents lost one third of the family income because salaries went down, pensions went down, rents went down, everything started going, uh, going down except prices because prices for most of the goods, they were imported and the exporters from the other countries, they didn't care if Greeks have to pay or not, they just exported less stuff there at, at some point. So you started to have problems not only in nominal, in the numbers, not only no, in nominal variables, you had started uh, problems that, uh, especially my parents, they started being like, okay, so we're going to cut down the vacation from two weeks to one week, and we're going to start uh, reducing some of the uh, luxuries that we used to have in the past. So you, you could see real changes in what people were doing. This is uh, with respect to macroeconomics, a brief introduction that will show you how everything works and along which lines we're going to move for the rest of the term. And now I want to make it a little more specific and start talking about the gross domestic product. So the gross domestic product is the total production of every economy. So GDP stands for gross domestic product and it measures the market value of goods and services that they are produced within the borders of a country during a year. So it's a very specific variable. It's specified very well. It's the same for every country. The statistical service of every country follows the same definition. What is it? The total value of the production of goods, services, everything that is sold, uh, produced within the borders of the country during a year. Okay, so this is the key variable because this is the best proxy that we have right now for prosperity. So the variable name, how we denote it in our calculations and in our models, will always be the capital case Y. Okay, it stands for income, and because we retain I, reserve I for investment, we will use it uh, as a Y here. GDP has many aspects, so you can view it from very different angles. You will see it as capital case Y, as GDP. Sometimes we refer to it as total production, aggregate or total output, total income, and aggregate expenditure. And you're like, hey, wait a second. These are all different things, like expenditure and income is not the same thing. It's not true. But uh, on the other hand, Y has many different aspects. The GDP has many different aspects, and this is exactly what we are going to see now. So GDP, the measurement of this variable, is in money. And it is in money because we produce very many different things. For example, you, you produce cars, and you produce education, and you produce also movies. You cannot add the total quantities of those and come up with an estimate for production. You have to estimate value. Okay, so if you want to estimate value, you are going to use, the, as unit, the currency of the country. So this is very important to understand that GDP is measured in monetary terms. However, GDP is not money. GDP is no, if I take the entire money that Singapore has, all the cash reserves, all the money, I collect all the money and I, I put it in a, in a big pile down at the marina in, in Singapore, uh, this, this doesn't mean that this will be the GDP. Okay, this is not even equal to the GDP, the amount of cash that is in the, in the entire economy. So GDP is measured in money, but it is not money. And this is something that uh, it's time now to put it in your, in your mind that 
do not confuse GDP with the amount of money circulated in the economy. There are three different approaches for measuring the GDP. Let's get busy now. This is the most difficult part of the lecture, which is still relatively easy, just requires a little bit of attention from you to put it in the right order in your mind. It's not difficult at all. But a lot of students that they look at the lecture a little superficially, they do not understand that and they have a lot of trouble later. So there are three ways to measure the same thing, GDP. If you want to measure how much a country makes, so how much you make is your total production. How much do you, do you make? What is your total production? All right, there are three ways to do that. The first way is either count the value of what everyone produces. That's straightforward. You uh, add the value of production because GDP is what? It's the production. Okay, so GDP is the production. If you add the values, if you sum up the values of everything that is made in this economy, you will have the GDP. That's one way, correct? So you measure total production, and then you can estimate how much GDP is. So this is your estimate. This is the real thing that you want to find out how, how large it is. The second way is that you can count how much everybody spends. You can, uh, you can count the spending. The third way is to count how much everyone earns. All right, how much everyone is earning in this economy. And all three aspects, they measure the same thing, but there are three different ways to estimate how much it is. Now, in our simple problems and methods of measuring the GDP that you will have in the problem set in the homework and possibly in the exam, you will see that all three methods, they, will, they must give you an identical result, the same uh, result. If it is possible for you to apply more than one method, you should take the same result because you're measuring the same thing. In reality, however, because of some accounting complications, you might have slight deviations with each way that, uh, because in real economies you can apply all three ways at the same time, you can actually eliminate and have a pretty good estimate for what the real, the actual GDP is. All right, so these are the three methods. Let's now see an example of how this works. Let's assume that we have one economy that produces only one good. Let's say uh, it produces a phone. So we have this phone, it's the total production of the economy. And uh, I go to the store and I will be like, how much is this phone? I look at the price tag, it's $250. $250, sure. So I take $250, I pay, and I take this phone. All right. So now, if I want to estimate the GDP of this economy. What are the possible ways to do it? The first way is that I have produced one phone which is worth $250. So, number one, $250, that is the value of this phone. All right, fair and square. There's nothing tricky about that. All right, now there's another method that I can see how much everyone spends. All right, so if I want to estimate how much is the income for this particular economy, the GDP for this particular economy, I will go and be like, okay, how much was spent here? This is how much is spent, $250. So the spending, the expenditure that we had in this economy is $250. Okay, I don't have to go to the phone anymore. I will go to the spending now, and this spending is the same value like it was the phone. If I want to estimate it in a third way, I can do the following. I don't look at the production. I do not look at the spending. I can look at the earnings. So. I, now, let's be on the side of the store. This guy will be like, okay, 
So this is I pay the first employee, then I pay the second employee, and then this is for what I pay for the guy who gave me the phone, and this is my profit. So first guy, first employee earned 50, second employee earned another 50, the guy who gave us the phone to sell, let's say, another 50, and then my profit, another 100, all together, one, two, three, four, five, $250. So, you measure the value of production, $250. You measure the expenditure, how much did I pay for this, how much money uh, uh, flew from me to the store, $250. How much it was earned, so this guy got a profit of 100, paid salaries of 50 plus 50, and paid, paid for the, uh, somebody else who produces that another 50. So again, this adds up to $250. So all these three methods give exactly the same estimate because they estimate the same thing from different aspects. So now you understand why GDP has so many names, because you can see it from many different ways, at least three here. All right, so let's continue. Uh, how do we measure the total production in detail from the side of the, oh, money, uh, from the side of production? All right, so in every economy, the total production can be grouped as final goods sold by firms to consumers intended for direct consumption. These are the goods that somebody will end in order to gain utility from those goods. Like for example, you buy a durian at the store and uh, that's something that you buy it because you wanna eat it and you want to have, uh, you want to have a final consumption from that, you want to gain utility from that. Or for example, you uh, go to the cinema and you watch a movie, that's a final good, you watch the movie because you want to have fun, in other words, to get utility. Now, there are also intermediate goods these are goods that sold by firms to other firms, to producing entities, in other words. Uh, one very important difference, as we said, let me remind you, is that the household, the individual, let's say, is the consuming unit of the economy, consumes unit in order to gain utility. The firm is the production unit of the economy. It just produces goods in order to maximize its profit because this will allow it to make the owner consume more. The owner is a household, the owner of the firm, right? Okay, so final goods and intermediate goods. Now, these are two different groups of goods and they have to do with the intent for which the good is sold or actually is bought. So if you buy a durian because you want to eat it, then this is the final good. If you buy a durian because you own a restaurant and you want to make a dessert with durian, I think they make desserts with durian, I'm not sure. But if you want to do that, then this is an intermediate good for you. Okay, so we have final goods and we have intermediate goods, which is not like a categorization of goods in terms of uh, it's mutually exclusive. Okay, a durian, can, depending on, on who buys it and for what reason, can be both an intermediate good or a final good. And the same goes with almost every good, except, let's say, massages and um, stuff like that. Okay, so GDP includes only the value of final goods. All right, because the value of intermediate goods will be included in the final price when you sell this final good. So when you sell, for example, a durian, and the guy who buys a durian is a restaurant owner who wants to make dessert with durian and sell the dessert, then if this person does right uh, price, uh, profit maximization, then this means that the cost of the durian, the value of the durian in other words, will be embodied in the final price of the dessert. So you don't have to count the value of the durian and the value of the dessert that includes the durian because the durian will be counted twice if you do that. So we use the price of every final good to estimate the market value uh, for the GDP, meaning that here, the best way to estimate how much something is worth is the price. Maybe it's not a very good estimate, but it's the best 
estimate we have. There's no uh, better estimate than that. So we'll use the price of final goods to estimate the market value for the GDP. For instance, if the economy produced a single good, then the GDP would be the price of this good times the quantity, because the total value of production. Okay, so before, for example, I produced one phone times 250, my GDP was $250, and we saw that there are three possible ways to measure that. All right, um, actually, if you produce only one good, then you don't even need the price here. Uh, the, the total amount of units will do the job. Like, for example, if you produce one year, uh, five phones, and then the next year you produce six phones, you understand that your GDP increased by 20%. You do not need the prices because you have only one kind of production. But what if you have many kinds of production? Let's assume that a very simplistic economy is one that has only three goods. And in this case, the total production will be what? P1 times Q1, the, the price of the first good times the quantity of the first good plus the price of the second good times the quantity of the second good, plus the price of the third good times the quantity of the third good. And if you had a million goods, you will keep doing that a million times and you will sum everything and you will get the value of GDP that again, we denote it with the capital case of Latin Y. The second method, the expenditure, the spending method that we did before, is uh, an alternative way to measure GDP. GDP is produced by firms. So GDP is, if you are producing something, if you are a producer, then automatically you have a firm aspect in the society. Like even these guys that they are in Europe and they, uh, they usually uh, go to a, uh, to a beach uh, in the summer and they put a tent there and then all day they make bracelets and then they sell the bracelets and they live like this uh, hippie life. Even them that, that they are registered nowhere, for, from an economics perspective, they act as a firm. So it's just a hippie that lives in the beach, but actually it, it functions in this economy as a firm, uh, as far as the sale of this particular good for money uh, is concerned. All right, so instead of appraising the production, we can sum the revenue from the sales of that production. So remember, Instead of appraising how much the phone is, you can just see how much came to the registry uh, of this firm from selling the phone. So it will be equivalent. So in the economy of three goods, when those goods are finally sold at some time, the expenditure by the consumers will be, they will pay the price times how much they will buy. At some point, they will buy the entire quantity of Q1, plus P2 times Q2, plus P3 times uh, Q3, uh, this should remind you of something. It's what we, we defined before to be our GDP. So again, equivalently, you get not only the same result, you actually have the same equation because you just see the same thing from the other side. All right. And uh, the expenditure by consumers must, of course, equal the value of production. Even when some goods now, they are not sold within the year. This is what I told you before that for accounting reasons, you might see some differences from the one method to another for, for complicated accounting uh, reasons. But even when you produce, let's say, something on December, and December is uh, of the previous year, this is a, the, pro the production should be registered for the year that December belongs. If you produce something December, 2020, what you produced in December 2020 should be included in the GDP of 2020. But you produced it in 2020, you had it in your store for 2020, and then nobody bought it till the 2nd of January of 2021. Still, if you produce something in 2020 and you do not sell it, this will be registered as inventory for the firm, and then accountants know and they write in the books the inventory, the value of the inventory, it's written in the books as expenditure by the firm. It means that the 
money that is, is embodied in this product that is produced in 2020, but is not yet sold, is registered as an expenditure for the firm. So you will still measure this from the side of the expenditure. Now, from the side of the income, a third alternative way to measure GDP is when we count the income that the sale of GDP brings to the household. If you have a three good economy, the total income will be the sum of two main things. Let's see them. So first of all, you have salaries for workers. So the wage that you will receive is your earnings from labor. And then you have profits for firms. In other words, this is the rent from owning capital. When you own a firm, you actually have put some capital in this firm and together with the labor that you hire and you pay for it, you earn profits or rents for your capital. It's the same thing. So there are two kinds of income in the economy, salaries for workers, W, and profits for firms. Now, the profit for firm is this, which is the amount of sales. So this entire thing here is your revenue minus your cost. What you pay? You pay your uh, labor. Okay, so you own the capital and you pay for the labor. Thus, the total value of income received by workers and owners of firms will be the salaries from workers plus the profit for the firm. And this will give us this nice little expression here. Now, if you look at it a little closely, you will realize that W appears twice. And once it appears with a plus sign, and once it appears with a negative sign. So you actually add W here, and then you subtract it from there. So you can actually cancel it out from both sides right here. And then what you get is P1 times Q1 plus P2 times Q2 plus P3 times QT, which is, again, exactly the same thing like before, the same equation like before. So this will give you, again, the value of the GDP. So the total value of income received by workers and owners of the firms is equal to the GDP. In other words, every dollar of spending has nowhere else to go, will either end in the pocket of a worker or will end in the pocket of a capitalist, an owner of the firm, in other words, but it will not disappear. It will not just be evaporated in, in to the air. So you understand that the spending at some point will become earnings from somebody, and that's why they are always equal. All right, so total GDP can be equivalently measured by adding the incomes of workers and capitalists in the economy. Let's uh, try to put everything together. I want to show you the circular flow uh, graph, which is a, a very helpful graph to understand a lot of things, a good introduction to what is coming for the rest of the semester and puts everything in a nice order. So I want to represent the connections that there exist in the economy between households and firms with a simple circular flow diagram. So there are four economic flows between firms and household. So this here is the firm and this side is the household, and I want to see what exactly, what are the economic connections between them. The first connection, the straightforward connection, is that the firms produce goods and services which are given for consumption to the household. So the, the firms do not consume, they use something in production to produce something else, but they do not consume themselves. The firms produce the final goods for consumption for the households. Now, in exchange to that, because the firms do not just hand out the, the goods and services randomly to the households, in exchange of that, you have a monetary flow, which is the aggregate expenditure. So goods go this way, expenditure in terms of money payment goes on the other way. So this is the first set of circular flows. The second set of circular flows is that the households now provide the firms with 
labor and capital. Okay, so the value of the capital that the firms own and the labor that the firms use in order to produce something, to produce the first flow up there. So the labor and the capital is coming from the households. The households are the owners of the capital and the households are the owners of the labor hours that they sell to the firm, all right? So labor and capital goes this way. And again, this doesn't happen just randomly. So the firms will pay. They there is another monetary flow on the other side. They will pay wages and the rest will be profit and everything will go to the household. Now, have in mind that every profit, one way or another, maybe you have like 30 uh, a chain of 30 offshores in order to launder your money somehow, like you earn money from one activity and then a, a, some firm overseas uh, launder it and then some other firms launder it again to, to make all uh, traces of of, uh, uh, that they lead back to you disappear. So it goes from firm to firm, from firm to firm, offshore in this chain of laundering. It will end up to somebody's pocket in the end. Okay, when this money ends up in your pocket, it's going to be like the same money. Money will end in somebody's pocket in the end. So what you have here is uh, a flow of goods and services, a counter flow of money that way to balance the first one. Then you have another flow of labor and capital that side. And then uh, by labor and capital here, by capital, we do not mean money. We mean like the ownership of production factors, the ownership of buildings, machines, everything. All right. Uh, if um, sometimes uh, students ask me, yes, but this uh, printer, for example, uh, this projector right here belongs to the university. It doesn't belong to a person. Yes, but there is a stakeholder for this, there's somebody who has shares of this university. In our case, it is the government of Singapore, one way or another, the people of Singapore in the end. So there is ownership of this capital, of this chair, of this desk. Uh, uh, this is mine. Uh, this belongs to, to, uh, uh, to, again, to the university, except for the uh, intellectual property, which belongs to me, I think. And uh, this is, uh, again, the ownership go comes from a household and is given for use to a firm. And then there is a counter flow to balance this in terms of money. I want you to observe something amazing. What I can actually do in this graph is that I can get rid of the money entirely. This can still work. Okay, this is like how society actually used to work before we invent money many, many uh, uh, thousands of years ago. So what are, actually are you doing? You are putting down capital and labor. Uh, you go to the production process with capital and labor, and then it comes back as goods and services. So imagine that you have somebody and says, okay, so uh, you are going to work for me and you are going to uh, give me also every capital that you want in order to put in this production, and then I will give you back uh, goods and services. So this can still work. For example, I can work in the university here. The university will tell me, okay, Cosmos, you will bring your equipment, your cameras, your uh, microphones, your uh, uh, slides, your laptop, everything, and you also will work here, and then I will not give you any money. I will just give you uh, everything that you need in terms of goods and services, this would be something that I would be like, sure. If you're actually giving me anything that I want in terms of goods, uh, I would not really care if you give me money or not. It's not that I have a thing with money, with the little papers. I have a thing for the value that I can buy with these little papers. If you tell me that you're not going to give me the little papers and you're just going to give me the value, I'm, I'm cool with that. So what you actually have here is a, a situation that you do not need money for this economy to work. Money is something that exists here to lubricate the system. All right, to make the system to go faster. And we will see later on why this uh, actually works. So the circular flow is a simplification of the economy. It leaves out important game-changing players here, uh, like, for example, the government, the banks, the foreign sector. But still, as a simplification, 
is very useful to show you what is going on here. Notice here that what is goods and services, the first one, is GDP from the side of production. What is the second one? Is GDP from the side of the spending, the aggregate expendi expenditure. What is this one? This is GDP from the side of earnings, from the side of income. Okay, so side one, side two, side three. And what is that? This is another way that you can measure GDP, but it's not very easy to measure it like that. Uh, it's um, extremely difficult. It is still accurate, but we almost never use it. We do not have national income accounts that they measure exactly that. No economy has. We just use one, two, three flows because they give us easy access to what GDP is. And this one is also can estimate the uh, of course, the output, but it's a little bit more complicated to do it, especially accounting-wise, it's very complicated, and that's why we do not use it. So let's go to the national income accounting. So every nation has the national income accounts that they measure these three ways that we measure output. So they, they try to measure output from all three alternatives. So how do they do that? They have the national income accounts, which are some, let's say, accounting books. Let's put it like that. And these accounting books, they, they, you just write, uh, you put entries with respect to what should be included in the GDP from each different perspective. Let's start from the side of the production. But again, we're not going to do the practice of the of the national income accounts, we are going to do the, the meaning of those accounts and what is important from an economic perspective. Okay, it will be interesting, you will see. The production-based national income accounts, they sum up uh, each domestic firm's value added to the production. So these income accounts, they go to every firm and they say, how much did you produce? But you, not everybody else that you bought stuff from in order to, to do your production. So in other words, they ask them, how much value has your company added to the economy? Okay, so this is not going to be the total value of your sales unless you make something from scratch. Okay, if you make something from scratch, then this is going to be your total, if for, for example, you produce salt, and you take, you extract the seawater, and then you uh, evaporate the water, and then you make the salt and you put it in a box, and you send it to the supermarket, then the price of the salt will be included in, the, in your contribution to the GDP. But if you buy, for example, a durian already, this is somebody else's production. Okay, that's why we said only the value of final goods uh, is included. You will see here why this happens again, but, here, the national income accounts of production measure the value that your particular firm has contributed to the GDP. All right, so here's an example. Firm A researches technology for vehicles. And once they come up with a, a viable technology, they sell it, they license it out, uh, $4,000 per vehicle, as many vehicles as you make that many times you're going to give us uh, 4,000. Now, this, uh, these guys, they make something from scratch, right? They are at the state that there is no technology, they develop this technology and they sell it. So this means that the value of this is, is entirely included in the GDP. So this is the value added that this firm adds. Now, firm B buys this technology and produces the car components that sells them for 16,000 per car. Now, you, sell car components, okay, the different parts that they make a car. You sell these components, but uh, you do not make them entirely. The technology that is embodied in these components, you bought it from somebody else. Somebody else has produced it. So you sell the total components for a car, they cost 16,000, but 4,000 of that is not your production. So your added value is $12,000. Now, Firm C buys those components and assembles them and uh, sells the car as assembled car now for $19,000. Now, the Firm C didn't produce a car, it just assembled a car. 
the value of the final product of the, of the goods here, which is a car, is $19,000, but this includes the technology. This includes the production of the components. So this means that the uh, firm C added to the economy just uh, 19 minus 12 that the second uh, uh, company added, minus four that the first, or you can just go 19 minus the entire value of the previous one, uh, 3,000. So firm C increased the GDP of the country by $3,000, no more than that. Firm D buys the car from firm C and then does the advertisement and the sale of the car for $23,000. Um, as you probably understand, these companies are not in Singapore because you cannot buy a car in Singapore with $23,000 as you could in the rest of the world. Uh, in Singapore, with this money, you can buy a, a Vespa maybe. Uh, but anyway, so... Uh, the final value of the car for firm D is 23,000, but 19,000 of that, it bought it from the previous firm. So actually the contribution of the firm D is 4,000. So the total value of production by A, B, C, and D is 23,000. Okay, 23,000 is the total value of all these activity of firm A, B, C, and D together. All right, so the 4,000, the 16,000, and the 19,000 from A, B, and C respectively, they are included in the 23,000. Okay, they are included. So if you, if you come here and you say, how much is my total production? My total production is four plus 16, plus 19, plus 23. You're gonna come up with 62,000 or something like that. And you are going to overestimate your GDP. You didn't produce that. Okay, if, if GDP worked like that, then here's what we would do. Like firm A would sell something to firm B, and then you would sell it back for a profit, and then you would sell it back to the other firm for a profit, and you keep going till you make the GDP to be a hundred quadrillion dollars, and you will be like the wealthiest in the world. But as you understand, this doesn't really measure real, real wealth. Right? So you, you don't want your number to be a bogus number. You want to really estimate what's going on. So you don't want to double count the same thing again and again. All right, so this car that this firm sells, in the 23,000, it has the technology development, the component production, the assembly, the advertisement, and the sale. Everything is included in uh, what firm D does. So for the calculation of GDP from the side of production, you can do one of the following two things. Either include only the value of the final good, like we did before, or if you want to go the long way, like the uh, national income account does, then you have to calculate the value added by each firm. So let me do it here in the margin. Uh, firm A researches car technology from scratch and produce something that is cost 4,000 per vehicle. So it's 4,000 from uh, firm A. Then firm B produces the components based on technology that it bought from A. This uh, added value will be 16 minus four. It will be 12,000. Then firm C assembles the component to a car and sells it for 19,000, but the components it bought it for 16,000. The 16,000 include also the production of technology. So in this case, the value added will be another 3,000. And then firm D will do the advertisement and the sale. And the value of that will be 23 minus 19, 4,000. And if you add those together, 4 plus 12 plus 3 plus uh, 4 again, it will be 23,000, which is exactly the same like the final value. So uh, because the final value includes all these added values, in other words. So you either ignore the intermediate goods and you go only for the final goods, or you do it like the national income account for production does it by adding uh, the value added by each firm in the economy, even though these goods are just intermediate goods. All right, how the national income accounts measure expenditure, and this is something that will be of great use from now on and uh, we are going to be, use it, to be using it in every lecture till the end of the term. So expenditure-based uh, national income accounts, they measure the purchases 
of goods and services, okay? So, so now you're talking about the expenditure on GDP, all right? So this can be split in five super useful categories. We will take them one by one. You will see that they make a lot of sense. They are not difficult to understand at all. So first category, consumption. This is the value of goods and services that they are bought by households, by consumers, in other words, excluding the spending on residential construction. So everything that you buy, everything that you buy uh, at home, like you buy fruit, you buy vegetables, you buy furniture, you buy, uh, let's say, uh, um, electronics, all these things that you buy, except when you buy a house. Okay, when you, when you buy a structure, this is not included in consumption. Why? Because this is not consumption, this is investment. Investment now is the value of new physical capital that is bought by domestic firms, plus inventories. We said before that inventories are also charged as expenditure, and residential construction, as we already said. So money that households pay in order to build a house or something like that. All right, so this is consumption by households. Investment is by firms. So C is what the households eat. I is what the firms use, all right? And then you have G, which is the government spending. So this is the value of purchases of goods and services by the government of the economy. And you exclude here transfer payments, like for example, pensions, like salaries for the public servants, all these are excluded. Why do you exclude them? Because this money actually will be counted as consumption, will be expended as consumption or investment by the, by the households. Okay, so for example, the money that the university used in order to buy a chair, this is G. Okay, this is G because this is something that belongs in, in the end of the life, belongs to the university, and the university belongs to the government, so this belongs actually to, to the government of Singapore. All right, but the salary that the government pays the university and the university gives me, this is not in G, why? Because it will be translated from me to either C or I if I buy a house. All right, so I will actually uh, use this money to, to again expand something. So when they pay me my salary, this is not included in G, it will be one way or another included in C, in I, and if you include it also in G, it will be, it will be uh, re-measured, again, double, uh, double calculation in this case. And uh, interest on government debt for some reasons of public economics that they are not very useful or interesting. Uh, the, the interest on government debt should not be included in G. And then you have exports. This is consumption by households, consumption by firms, consumption by government, consumption by the foreigners outside of the borders. All right, so this is how uh, GDP works. And then you have, uh, you will be like, okay, so who is left? Nobody is left, but you have also to count for imports. Imports is not part of our GDP, but it's part of our consumption. So it should be, our, when I say our, I mean either for C, either for I, or for G. So what you import is going to become consumption. Okay, something that you import will be consumed. Or something that you import will be, if you import, for example, a bulldozer from China, it will become, uh, it will be counted as investment by a firm. Uh, or you have the government spendings if you import, for example, an uh, F-22 air, uh, uh, air fighter from the United States, this will be a part of, of G in this case. So the imports, they should be uh, not included here, they should be subtracted, they should be excluded. We will see that in a moment. All right, so there is an identity that is super useful for us, and this is tricky, so I want you to pay attention. It's once you understand what the trick is, you're home free, okay? But 
pay attention because a lot of students miss that and then they have trouble understanding what's going on. So the aggregate expenditure in the economy will be what households consume, C. What firms invest, in other words, firms use, I. What the government sector uses and what the foreign sector uses minus what we use from foreign GDP right here. So this is actually an identity. This is, if you add all these things together, you have the total expenditure in the economy, which let's, uh, let's um, agree here that we are going to call it the aggregate expenditure. The term X minus M, I put it in parentheses because it concerns the foreign sector and we want to group it together. Okay, group it together. It makes sense if you group it together because it concerns the foreign sector. Uh, we subtract M because its value will be included in either consumption or investment or government spending. So we actually do not have to double count this. So X minus M is what we call the net exports. Okay, we deal with the net exports because as a variable, it's much more convenient uh, to deal as one variable rather than consider different exports and different imports. So aggregate expenditure is a decomposition of GDP based on the destinations of the output, who consumes what. Now, look at the title a little bit. The, this is about the national income accounting identity. Okay, this is an identity. An identity is an equality that holds all the time. So if you consider here in the aggregate expenditure, this equality sign between AE and C plus I plus G plus X minus M, this equal sign is not really translated as AE is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. It's not translated as it's equal, it's translated as is. So aggregate expenditure is the C plus I plus G plus X minus M. We define aggregate expenditure to be the sum of those five things. Now, as we already showed, the value of Y equals with the aggregate expenditure. We said that one of the aspects of aggregate expenditure is the production. So Y, which is the production, should be equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Be careful now. Aggregate expenditure is C plus I plus G plus X minus M. But Y is equal to the aggregate expenditure, which is C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So in the first equality here, we have that aggregate expenditure is C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And in the second one here, we have that production should be equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So production is not that, is equal to that. All right, so indicatively in the US that your textbook has data for, consumption is 68.5%. Investment is pretty low to 5.9%. Government spending 18.6%. And net exports are negative uh, minus 2.9%. And I want to emphasize on two things here, or maybe three. Uh, first of all, the investment is very low. I will show you in a little bit the investment in Singapore. You will see what uh, a decent investment looks like. Uh, the second thing is that the net exports are negative, meaning that uh, United States actually imports too much stuff from China. Uh, that's pretty much where the exports are coming from for the United States. And their exports, the United States exports to other countries, they are high, but still United States has a negative uh, trade deficit because they import a lot of things from China. And then we have the government spending, which is considerably high, 18.6%. The actual spending is around 9%, and then the rest 9% is for one single thing. If you want to think about what is the single thing that the American economy, the American government spends almost 9% uh, of the income on, 
pause the video and give it a second to think about, like make your brain to work a, a little bit to, uh, to, to wake up again. Pause the video, think about it, and let me know if you understand it. All right, so it is spending for national defense. All right, so they spend massive amounts of money for national defense. I, I don't really know from what they have to defend, but uh, it's maybe spending uh, for national attack or something like that. But in general, it's military spending that, that is extremely high. No other country even matches the spending uh, there. So there are some things that you can understand from that. Let's see what is going on with Singapore, which is pretty interesting. So here we have the years from 1960 up to uh, 2015. This is a major uh, figure because I want to show some things that uh, you, must, you must understand. You cannot leave this class, especially if you are from Singapore or you're studying in Singapore. Uh, you have to know a, a few things about that because they are essential. They actually show what this country is about, the character of this country, at least from the sense of what it has achieved through the years. Okay, okay. and this is uh, very important. So, and this is the percentage of GDP that you spend uh, on every of these things. So here is the spending for consumption. So started from almost 90%. Singapore in the 60s was spending 90% of its income for consumption. And then this is what happened to investment. Investment was super low and it was massive between the years 70s up to 2000, and now it has stabilized to uh, almost triple of what it is in the United States. So we're talking about massive investment. Investment is what is going to bring you the wealth of the future. Consumption is what is going to bring you the happiness now. Investment is what is going to bring you the happiness of the future. Okay, and this is important here. And then let's check what happens with government spending. This is another key component here because you will see that Singapore is actually flat with respect to government spending. It's at the 10%. And this is something that is quite important because if you go in the US, you will see that when there is a Republican president, spending is, government spending is low. When there is a Democrat president, the spending is high, and spending goes together with the election cycles like, like that. So this is not what we see here in Singapore. In Singapore, we have consistency. If you go to other countries, like for example, if you go to Greece, you will see that uh, the spending in Greece, it doesn't depend on if the government is a left government or a right government. It, be, it depends on something else. It depends how close to elections you are. So no matter if you are left or a right candidate, if you are an incumbent, you will be like, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to save money for the government, keep the government spending low uh, uh, for three years, and then in the fourth year, which is elections every four years, so uh, uh, in, the, in the fourth year before the election, the year before the election, I will actually spend all the money that I have in the, uh, in, the, in the cashier of the government, and I will try to win elections because I think that my voters have such a short memory, so they will not remember that I had austerity for three years, so I will be able to spend all the money in the fourth year. So you will see that, again, you have cycles there. Uh, they don't go according to the ideology of the country. They go according to political interest. In uh, Singapore, this doesn't work. And then uh, you will see that the net exports is another success story. So from negative, you go to the positive, and this is amazing because you were a buyer for the foreign sector as far as the foreign sector is concerned, but now you are a seller. So uh, you are in the, uh, in the trade business, in the uh, bioproducts business, in the uh, med medications business, uh, research and technology and all these expensive, high quality stuff that they come out of Singapore. And this is what have changed the picture of the entire country from what it used to be 
in the 60s to what it is actually now. And here is another thing that is very important. I want you to see the red and the blue curves because the red and the blue curves will show you what will actually make you prosper, not only as a country, even as an individual. Because if you think for your personal finances, you go through pretty much these things also, especially consumption and investment. So the basic difference between rich and poor nations, and the basic difference also between rich and poor people is that the rich, they spend their money on investment. They spend their money on assets. While the poor, they spend their money on consumption goods, goods that they will bring them happiness now, but nothing into the future. Let's go to the income side now. So the third way that we see uh, GDP is the income side, the earning side. Uh, they can decompose into two key categories here. Uh, labor income, as we saw already, so income from labor services. This can be wages, can be salaries, can be bonuses, can be health coverage, pension benefits, or uh, various perks. So, for example, in my salary, I have an agreement from the university that I'm given a budget so I will be able to buy things that I need to do my job, to travel, uh, when traveling was allowed in the pre-COVID era and conferences were happening and stuff like that. Uh, so we're given this budget that is not, is not counted as um, salary. It's, a, it's a, a budget that is something that it's given to you as a benefit in something else. I'm also given uh, some benefits in health insurance that I can have uh, a free checkup, I can have uh, free dental. All these are, are stuff that they are counted in my earnings, but they are not in my wage. Okay, and uh, they also uh, give us uh, perks. Like for example, they give us particular, uh, for particular venues, tickets for events, for uh, you can visit some of the museums without paying by just, uh, the university will give you a card and you can visit for even Gardens by the Bay and all these uh, shows. You can actually go and, and uh, book with, with this card. And this is something that is given to us, not in a form of monetary income, but as a form of a perk that uh, will actually allow us to connect also with the society and to make sure that, uh, that we spend this particular income on these, uh, on these uh, uh, events instead of just going and buying stuff off of Amazon and stuff like that. All right, so labor income and then capital rent. So the, uh, the word the rent is the money that you make from the use of, uh, of capital. Like for example, you rent uh, a home, which is your capital, you own it. So you rent a home and then you get to rent, or you, uh, you rent some equipment to somebody else and then you get rent from, from, from that. All right, and this is like dividends are rents. You actually own some part of a company and the, according to the stocks, the companies will give you dividends. So this is a capital earning. Uh, interest payments from money that you have in the bank. Earnings retained by corporations, this again, earning by capital that stay in the company is not given as a dividend. Rent payments for, uh, from real estate, even the benefit of living in your own house is capital rent. So if you own a house and you don't rent it out, but you live into it, so the, the amount of how much the opportunity cost of the rent is something that you are utilizing at this moment. So that is actually an income from rent. So remember now, something that we repeated several times before, uh, that firms are owned by households. This means that earnings will end up in some individual's pocket one way or another. Firms will not, even if they retain some, uh, uh, some earnings, at some point, either this will go into investment and create future earnings that they will end in somebody's pockets, or they will end in somebody's pockets at some point, uh, one way or another. So, so companies do not consume income, individuals consume their income in the end. So these are the GDP components in Singapore. Here is the capital earnings. And here is the labor earnings. 
And because these two variables are not taxed, uh, here is the earnings from taxes. Singapore is one of the few countries that earning from capital is actually higher than earning for labor. For the United States, what you have is that two thirds of income are earned as uh, salary from, from workers, and then one third is earned as capital earnings. And here in Singapore, you have the opposite because you have a lot of local and foreign corporations that they do business in Singapore and they earn a lot of money in terms of capital earnings. So that's why you see that the red curve is above this uh, blue line there. In most of the countries of the world, it's the other way around. So yes, Singapore is a wealthy country, but don't forget that a lot of this wealth actually is with corporations, it's capital gains. And capital gains is what makes this division of uh, income in the population. Because poor people and rich people, the difference is not that the poor are making low salaries and the rich, the real rich, make high salaries, okay? Jeff Bezos' salary is $1 per year. So he, he works for Amazon for $1 per year. That's his official salary. Okay, Amazon is taking advantage of him. Like, like he works for so many 18 hours a day and he's getting paid $1. The reason that he's almost a trillionaire, depending on when you're watching this video, his value, how much he's worth, is not from his salary, it's because from capital earnings. All right, so you see here that the difference between the rich and the poor is exactly this, how high this red line is. So this actually, this graph here will show you a hint of what creates also income inequality in the population of a country, okay? And this is kind of a bad sign for Singapore. We'll see the exact data in the next lecture, but for now, this gives us a suspicion that this is going to be a not very equal society in the very end. All right, there is a similar measurement to the GDP. It's called the GNP, GDP refers to production by the country's residents within the country's borders. And then you have the GNP, which is a, a variation of the measurement of income. Uh, GNP stands for gross national product and refers to production by the country's citizens. So how is GNP related to GDP? GNP will be equal to the GDP if you add to the GDP the production of domestic factors that they are active abroad, and you subtract the production of foreign factors that they're active within the country's borders. Now, let's see an example to make things a little more clear. As you know, I'm a Greek citizen. Okay, so my production takes place in Singapore. I am here, I work here, I produce here, but I'm not a Singaporean citizen, I am a Greek citizen. So my production, whatever I produce, belongs to the GDP of Singapore because it's produced within the Singapore's borders. My production does not belong to the GDP of Greece because even though I'm Greek, I'm not producing something there, I'm producing something here. My production, however, belongs to the GNP of Greece because independently of where I produce it, I produce it, I hold a Greek passport, and that's why my production is a part of the GNP of Greece and the GDP of Singapore. Okay, for Singapore, my production is not in the GNP of Singapore. So if you calculate the GDP of Singapore, this lecture here that I produce should be, the, the added value that's coming from me should be in the GDP of Singapore, but not in the GNP of Singapore because I'm not a citizen here. All right, this is uh, with respect to the national income accounting. Let's go now to a very interesting part of the discussion, the measurement flows. In general, the GDP is something that we insist on calculating it from so many different ways and be precise about it. Because in reality, the GDP is the best estimate that we have for the prosperity of a country. 
And a country that has high GDP per, per capita will be prosperous. A country that is poor will not be prosperous. So we, we can use the GDP as a proxy for happiness. And that's why we are very interested in doing that. Now, when you measure happiness, you have to include a lot of things that they are uh, immaterial, right? So happiness affected by a lot of immaterial things. Uh, and here in the GDP, we only count material things. But the premise is the following, and actually it's a right one. Here, here it is. So we do not claim that material goods or money, let's say, brings the happiness. Okay, we do not claim that. We just claim that if you solve the basic problems of the country with respect to material goods, then you have more chances for happiness than, than if you do not even solve those problems. In my country, we have a saying for that, which goes as following in uh, free translation. Money does not really bring happiness. But if you are unhappy, it's much better to cry your pain within a Maserati rather than cry in a Toyota. And this really says everything with respect to what we are doing here. So we are going to talk about material goods and we will talk about that because they actually uh, is a good proxy for how happy uh, somebody is going to be. And even when you measure the material goods, sometimes the GDP measurement, even though we try to be as precise as possible, it does have serious flows. So physical capital depreciation is one of them. So physical capital depreciation is the reduction of the value of physical capital due to two reasons. First of all, obsolescence, and the second is wear and tear. So for example, you buy a computer, and this computer, as you use it in, in the production process, it will have wear and tear. So for example, maybe the hard drive will burn out and you will have to replace it. Maybe the video card will start, uh, will start giving you some artifacts and you will have to, to fix it at some point. Or it can actually suffer, we, you don't even use it, and it suffers the cost of obsolescence. Like for example, if you buy a computer uh, in the 1980s, today this computer will be totally useless in the production process because all new software will not be able to be supported by this computer. It may not be even uh, able to connect to the internet in today's uh, speeds with today's data. Okay, so what we actually have here is that capital loses its value from year to year, either because of natural wear and tear or because of obsolescence. Like, for example, even things that they do not have any wear and tear. If you go and you buy uh, Microsoft Office, you just buy a subscription to it, there's no wear and tear. If something happens to the code of the software in your computer, you can just erase it and uh, re, uh, re download it from Microsoft and all this. Or even if it's in CD, uh, Microsoft will give you a new CD replacing the old one. So there is zero wear and tear, but there is obsolescence. If you buy, for example, Windows 2000, uh, uh, Windows 2000, Windows Millennium, how they call it, or Windows 3.1, which was the, my first operating system, my first computer, uh, this program will be totally useless today. No applications will work on this operating system whatsoever, even though you can still download the code in perfect condition, like it was written back in the, in the end of 1980s by Microsoft. All right, so most productive processes cause capital to lose value. Machinery wears down. Electronic equipment gradually becomes obsolete. Uh, resources deplete. So if you sell oil at some point, it will start finishing, okay? And all these actually make capital to lose value. We do not include this in the measurement. So a meaningful calculation of production should subtract the depreciation because Depreciation is loss of value. Okay, so if you have, for example, if you use, for example, a bulldozer and you, uh, uh, you dig holes in the ground and uh, you dig like a hundred holes at some point, the, you will have a lot of wear and tear in the bulldozer. So your production will actually, uh, I don't know why holes would be production, but assume that you need those holes. Uh, so you produce the holes, but uh, you actually 
have the wear and tear that you should include, and you will include it in the value of the company, of course, but in the value of the GDP, we do not include that. In most economies, depreciation is estimated by economists with indirect ways because we do not have exact data to around 10 to 15% of GDP. However, uh, these estimates are far from consistent, far from being precise, and far from being even well-defined. Okay, for example, depreciation estimates do not cover natural resources depletion. You do not even know how much resources you have. They have this, uh, uh, they supposedly found, when I was in Cyprus in 2012, they, uh, they found natural gas. And they were so happy. They, everybody uh, in the island would think that, oh, in the next 10 years, we would be Qatar here. Like, we'll produce so much natural gas and everybody will be wealthy and all this. So it was the, the joke that was going around. And uh, you had this um, uh, research that one company will tell you there are 2 billion gallons of natural gas, and the other research will tell you there are like 13 trillion of, uh, of natural gas. So, so you don't know how much exactly is, so you cannot really appreciate how much uh, you are using, you're extracting every year. Worsening of environmental conditions. So you have the production. Production creates the negative externalities that they deteriorate the conditions. And then you will, this will be something that probably it will affect, let's say, your tourism in the future. Okay, like for example, you give a permit for somebody to extract gold in the mountain across from the beach and they extract gold, but then uh, gold extraction, if you do not know that, it messes up the environment around, especially the waters, and then all the water will become brown in the area. So all the hotels that were on the other side of the coast, now they are going to lose business because of this externality, which is because of the worsening of environmental conditions. And this is not included the depreciation of the environment itself. Changes in the population's health, uh, you have a major health cost. And if you go, for example, in the industrial areas of China that production exploded in the previous decades, you will see that in the, in the zones of, the, of construction and, and uh, industrial production, if you see the health of the people and the, I'm not talking about the rates of cancer and all this, I'm talking about the uh, expect the life expectancy in one place and another, they are vastly different even for people that they do not work in these production zones. They, they are uh, homemakers or they have another job in an office. You will see that, that the production takes a toll in the health of the population. This is also not included. And it's actually an economic measurement, not only a, a happiness measurement, because if you're your population is actually getting sick and dies, this reduces the productive ability for the future. And this is something that it will alter actually the same number in the future. Brain drain is another source of depreciation that is not included in the GDP. You will see, for example, in economies that they decide to specialize in tourism that uh, what do you need if you are a tourist economy? You need waiters, you need people who work in hotels, people that work in restaurants, people that they work in airlines. You do not need the research scientists, you do not need uh, professors of university, you do not need that many doctors, you do not need that many scientists, engineers, and all this. So you will see that all these people, they will actually start immigrating in different places for a better life. And a prominent example for this is what happens with crisis. Crisis in an economy creates this depreciation. So you will see, for example, in 2009, that the big crisis hit Greece, you will see that there was a massive wave of immigration from Greece to other countries. Greece is a country that has particularly high level uh, of education for its people. So if you go today in Germany, you will see that some of the best doctors, they work in Germany. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you will see some of the best architects, they work there. If you go to Qatar, now that they prepare for the next World Cup, you will see that most of the, uh, of the best companies that they build the stadiums, they are Greek companies. If you go to Singapore, you will see that the best professors there, they are from Greece and all this stuff. So, brain drain uh, 
changes in health, environmental condition, resource depletion. These are all things that they do affect not only happiness, but they do affect the GDP of the country and they are not actually what, what should be counted in the GDP, but they are not included in the GDP. Home production is another thing that is production, but is not included in the GDP. If uh, your mom makes you a cake at home, uh, this is not included in the GDP. The added value to make the cake, the ingredients are included, but the making of the cake is not. While if you buy the same cake at the store, uh, the, the, the value of making it is actually included. So for the same cake, it's, it's, one is included and the other is not included, even though the production is the same. So excluding home production from a GDP is for sure a flaw, but um, there's nothing we can do here still, at least yet, because uh, it's very difficult to actually measure home production. There's no way to measure it uh, effectively. The problem of measurement is mostly practical. We do not object in including it. Most of the countries, they would love to include it, actually, for reasons that I will tell you a little later, but they do not include it. And this is because there is no documented market transaction. So when your mom makes you a cake, I, uh, I hope that uh, she doesn't give you a receipt. Here's your cake, son, and here's also the receipt. Uh, can you pay me now? Because... Uh, I, I will close the, the registry for later or stuff like that. I, I hope it doesn't happen like that. So there is no documented transaction. There is no objectivity in the transaction. You could say, okay, this uh, uh, cake uh, costs like a million dollars. It's like, why is that so expensive? Because it includes the best ingredient. What is it? Love. Okay, so how can you appreciate love? It's like, it costs a lot. All right. So you cannot really appreciate it in a convenient uh, and uh, practical way that will be also objective. So this is very difficult to happen. There is no formal process of pricing or quantity, even quantity appreciation. Like, for example, uh, one of the uh, most important production that happens at a home level is child care. Okay, so you care for your child, but how much of this is child care and how much of this is just normal expected parenting? Okay, so how much you're replacing the babysitter because you're not hire, hiring one, and how much is just spending quality time with your children? Okay, so you cannot really separate the two things together, let alone measure them and pricing them. So an estimated of 15% value uh, on top of the GDP, additional to the GDP, takes place at home. And this is something that, unfortunately, we cannot include in the GDP. And this is food preparation, household maintenance, child care, housework, a lot of stuff happens uh, at home. Like, for example, you uh, cook at home, maybe you want to paint the walls, maybe uh, you will do a lot of home production, as we said before, babysitting and all this, that if you hire a professional, they would uh, charge you and this will be in the GDP. If you do not hire a professional, you do, it, you do them yourself. The final result is the same, but uh, you, uh, the final production is the same. You still have uh, a child that is taken care, a wall that is painted, a cake on the table, but they are, all these are not in the GDP. The underground economy is not included in the GDP either. The underground economy refers to transactions that they are intentionally hidden from the authorities for two reasons. The first is transactions that they are not illegal that happen under the table for three main reasons. First of all, tax evasion. Like for example, you call a plumber at home to fix the faucet and the plumber tells you that um, uh, should I not give you a, a receipt so I will not have to pay the tax and you will save a little bit from the bill? Also, happens all the time in Greece. And this is like tax evasion and you don't want to give a receipt. So the whole uh, service will not be included in the GDP, even though it exists in the economy. So the whole service, the whole production there of the plumber will go underground. Second reason is immigration status, especially in countries that they have a lot of uh, illegal immigration, and you will see that there even nothing illegal is produced, like the gardener just uh, takes care of, cuts the grass in the, uh, in the, 
yard and then uh, you pay them in cash because uh, he, he would love to be able to issue you a receipt and everything, but he cannot do that because he's an illegal immigrant and he's not allowed to even be there. And then you have uh, very many personal reasons, like for example, uh, my dad who goes to the bakery and he buys a donut and he asks to not issue a receipt, so my mom will never know. Okay, so you can find like many reasons that they are not actually illegal. Of course, it's illegal the process of going to the underground economy, not including something in the in in the in the receipt or in the in the in the tax statements and everything like that. But in general, the the transactions they are not illegal, and there are also the illegal transactions that cannot take place officially, like. Uh, drug dealing, like prostitution, bribes, and all these things. And this um, actually uh, conforms to my pledge that I will have to talk in every lecture for drugs and prostitution. But in general, this is a, an important issue that a lot of economists, they take it very uh, seriously. So for example, here it's not, the, the problem is not that uh, the transaction is legal and you just have reasons to not include it in the GDP is that the GDP will not even recognize this type of production as production. And of course, as you understand, you cannot be like, okay, so here is your receipt for the cocaine you ordered, four grams of cocaine. Uh, here is your receipt signed here. Yes, thank you so much. Enjoy your, your day. So you cannot do that as you understand. And then as... Uh, the, this production production will not be in the GDP at all because the transaction now is entirely illegal. In developed countries, the underground economy is about 10%. Okay, 10% of the economic activity is underground. In uh, not very developed countries, it may even exceed the 50%. I remember when I was in, uh, in Russia, I lived in Russia for seven years, and every store, when you would go and buy something, they would give you a receipt. Every store will give you a receipt. In Greece, less than half of the stores, they will give you a receipt. Most of the times, they will try to sell you something under the table. That's the social norm there. In Russia, this never happened. But in Russia, it was impossible to rent a flat if you wanted to pay through the bank, with a bank transaction. So the owner of the flat would always ask you, the landlord, how are you gonna pay me? And they always wanted payment in cash. And if you didn't want them to pay in cash, you want to pay with a bank transaction, you had to pay 13% more, which was the entire tax that they would have to pay. And sometimes they do not even accept because this will bump them to a higher tax scale and they didn't want that. So it was a big problem to rent something uh, legally there. While in Greece, this never happens. When you uh, rent something, it will be totally legal. You will have a lease and a contract and, and everything. So different economies, uh, uh, they are different uh, in, in, that, in that extent. And you can see that the, the size of the underground economy can vary from 10% to over 50%. There are some really underdeveloped economies that very few of the transactions, they actually happen officially. Now, recently, many countries like Ireland, Italy, Greece, of course, the UK and other countries, they have started including some illicit activities in the GDP. Like for example, the legalization of some semi-legal activities uh, like it happened almost uh, 15 years ago in Greece, that finally Greece decided to legalize uh, sex work. And this was a major issue because there are specific social reasons, very important social reasons to legalize uh, uh, sex work. And this is mainly because you can have the people that they work in the specific industry to be able to have decent healthcare, to have a pension, to be able to have insurance, and all these things that they are necessary almost for everyone. And usually when the concern when you want to legalize from a, a, a job like that, from a social aspect, is to be able to make a little bit more secure those people that they work there, and also to expose them in less danger, because if you actually are a sex worker 
in a country that is illegal, it's very difficult for you to have the testing that you require, the health testing for STDs and all these serious diseases that they might hit people like, uh, in, this, in these industries. Uh, it's very difficult to have uh, health insurance. You have to pay from your own pocket and some of these people, they cannot do that. Uh, you are exposed in danger because you cannot have protection from the police and all this. And there are some serious concerns and countries that they have legalized, they have legalized mainly for these reasons. But not these countries that they did that. These countries, they did it for a specific reason. Greece, for example, legalized prostitution because it wanted to increase its GDP, to include it in the GDP so GDP will seem bigger. Why do you want your GDP to appear bigger? There is a very specific reason for that. So, bear with me. Most of the countries, they, they need to borrow money in order to be able to survive. And Greece, legendarily, is one of those countries. So Greece, for many, many years, it was living on loans. The, the government sector was living on loans in order to be able to provide all these expenses and purchase, government's purchases and all this, uh, to maintain the army and, and many, many other things. So when you borrow money in the international markets of, of bonds, uh, the government bonds, what actually matters there is the country's risk. I will lend my money to a country only if I know that I will be getting this money back plus the interest at some point. So I need to know what is going on with respect to the risk. And if a country has bigger risk to repay me than another country, I will only lend the money if they give me a much higher interest rate. In other words, the interest rate will include a danger uh, component, they're a danger premium. Now, how do you measure the danger when countries have to borrow money? There is a specific ratio, and this is debt to GDP. In other words, debt is how much you owe, GDP is how much you have. This ratio, debt to GDP, is very important for the lenders. If a country has a low debt to GDP ratio, this means that they do not owe a lot of money, so probably they are very far away from bankruptcy. It's a safe destination for money. So these countries, they will be able to borrow money at a low interest rate. Now, if your debt to GDP ratio is high, it means that you owe a lot of money relative to what you make, and this means that you're in danger of bankruptcy. So if I want to lend you money, you have to, to give me a much higher interest for this money. All right, so countries have an interest to present the debt to GDP ratio to be as low as possible. How can you do that? First way, keep your debt low, which is something that Greece didn't want to do. Second way, make your GDP to appear higher so the denominator is higher, the whole fraction will seem lower. How do you do that? By just inflating the GDP, by adding things to it that before they were illegal, and now you say, no, no, we legalize the uh, sex work because it's uh, uh, an important part of the economy. We want to offer uh, to these people protection and all this, which is a bunch of BS. Okay, what they really wanted to do is they wanted to decrease the debt to GDP ratio so they would be able to borrow money cheaper because they were already a little bit before the crisis, which in Greece was a debt crisis, and it was a very important thing to make the GDP to appear higher. Now, the mastermind behind that is actually the professor who taught me macroeconomics when I was an undergrad student. His name is... George Alokoskoufis, he was a minister of economics for Greece back then, and he was uh, my professor for several years. Actually, uh, I owe him a lot of things because he was the one who gave me a reference letter and I was able to be accepted with um, uh, funding from, from the US uh, to, to finish my studies. But he became the minister of economics in Greece, and he thought about this because he saw that the debt to GDP ratio was really bad and he wanted to improve it or else the country would, would hit the rocks very quickly. And he was able to delay the crisis for a long time. And when the crisis started, he was not a minister anymore. He had stepped down and another person had uh, uh, took over and 
the second guy, it was already too late. You couldn't do anything for the crisis. So uh, these countries, they actually want to count these illicit activities to the GDP. But now you understand also a little bit more of the politics that they are behind there. Uh, behind this measurement, and that's why I did this uh, parenthesis, so you will actually also have this kind of view for the material. Negative externalities, we already touched on that. Externalities, either negative or positive, they are usually omitted from GDP. And uh, GDP counts the value of production, but fails to subtract the byproducts, which are usually bad, like residuals, pollution, noise, health problems, all these, they make the quality of life to be worse, but they are not counted in the GDP. So often, negative externalities have a very strange effect. Instead of making the GDP to go down because they are negative externality and they produce damage in the economy, uh, not for the, for the markets that they are produced, but for other markets around those markets, so bystanders have uh, to face some serious negativity from these negative externalities. Uh, but not only they are not included as a negative contributors to the GDP, actually they are included as positive contributors. And this is crazy. Look how this strange thing really works. Let's assume that industrial production in an area increases the GDP, but it also creates Water pollution. Now, this will necessitate that uh, residents have to use water filters, and the value of water filters should count as a damage from the negative externalities, not a good thing that you use uh, water filters. The good thing is if you enjoy natural water, if you have to filter your water in order to drink it, that's, no, that's, that's a cost that you take, a damage that you take because of the externality. You don't do it because it improves your life uh, relative to how natural water is. But instead of that, it's adding to the GDP because like every other good that is traded, adds to the value of the GDP. So the purchase, the money that you spend on the water filters, actually make GDP to go higher. So instead of decreasing GDP by this money, you actually increase the GDP by this money. You make it appear increased, even though happiness goes down, like, like material good happiness, let's say, goes down. So negative externalities is a problem, should be included, but they are not included. And leisure, is another thing, is a definitive component of happiness and well-being, but it's not included in the GDP at all. In time use surveys, we know that uh, people consider leisure perhaps the most important component of happiness after health. Okay, so they say that their happiest moments is when they have free time to socialize with their friends and family. Residents of different countries work at different levels of intensity, like for example, uh, banks in uh, Germany, they close every day at five o'clock in the evening, and on Fridays, they close at seven o'clock in the evening, because uh, on Friday is the end of the week, it's when you need to use the bank most. In Greece, on the other hand, banks every day close at two o'clock, and then on Friday, they close one hour earlier at one o'clock because, you know, it's Friday and people have to hit the beach one hour earlier. Okay, so people work at a different level of intensity. All right, and this makes a major difference in production, which doesn't reflect so much in the happiness. Okay, because you work, you make much more in terms of money, which then you have to use leisure in order to have happiness. And because you made more money from working more, now you have less uh, leisure time. So this creates this problem that uh, the numbers there, they are not the measurements, they are not that consistent with what makes you happy or not. So residents of different countries, they do work at different levels of intensity. Plus the cost and the quality of leisure is actually very different from country to country because in Greece, you make less money because you close at one o'clock on Friday, of course, and then still 
you can take the bus and you can go to a world-class beach that is like 15 minutes from, from your work and you can enjoy the rest of your Friday there. While if you live in Germany, you make much more money, which will actually have to pay for tickets to come to Greece to the same beach to enjoy your, your summer there. Okay, so it's not 20 minutes away, it's a three hours flight plus uh, 20 minutes away. So this makes a difference in the sense that um, a Greek can have for free the beach that a German can actually have only if they pay a bunch of money for hotel, for traveling, for all these things, okay? And take days off as well. All right, so GDP tells you how many materials goods are being produced in the economy, but it does not tell you how those goods contribute to the happiness of the citizens, okay? And different countries, they report different levels of happiness. Uh, the crisis has had a major effect here. Before the crisis in 2006, 2007, in the happiness surveys, Greeks would self-report that they were, they had happiness level in the way that they statistically you measure happiness, uh, larger than even people from Scandinavia that traditionally they score very high in the surveys uh, they used to have. Okay, and this was why, because you didn't make a lot of money, you made okay money back then in Greece, uh, but you had everything like, everything you wanted was in a working distance, everything that could make you happy, like the nightlife, like the beach, like a, a decent health system, which the government was maintaining with uh, borrowing money. Uh, everything was pretty much there. Okay, from another country, you will, like for example, if you live in Moscow, uh, most um, people from Moscow, they are the best tourists for all the tourist economies because there is nothing near there. So they travel to Greece, they travel to Italy, to Portugal, to Spain. They are their best customers there because in order to enjoy a sunny day, you have to travel to these places. Okay, so, so you understand here that we use material goods as a proxy, but sometimes you can have differences in happiness that they are not due to GDP. And you have to understand that this is a measurement for something, but this is not really a perfect proxy. It's an okay proxy, but not a perfect one. Okay, and this brings me to the external video of the day. It's from The Hill, one of the most impartial and independent journalist institutions today uh, in the whole world. Uh, Crystal Ball and uh, Sagar and Jetty in the morning uh, show, The Rising, they discuss their own view on how the metrics prosper, but the people suffer. So what is happiness? How can it be measured? And it's a discussion with, based on the opinions of these two people. You do not have to agree with them, but their opinions will be very useful for you to know. Uh, believe me, it's something that it's worth for you to watch. And this brings me to talking a little bit about inequality. Inequality will be a broad topic that we will revisit again and again, but I would like here to get the discussion started. So we will just uh, lay down the, the groundwork in order to be able to talk about it later. So let's talk about inequality. We live in a world of significant disparities, standards of living, educational opportunities, health services, even infrastructure, they differ tremendously between countries. As a matter of fact, it's important for everyone to understand and to acknowledge, uh, even if we think that this is politically correct or even just correct or not, uh, to understand that the amount of opportunities that you will have in your life and the access to resources that you will have in your life is vastly dependent on the passport that you're holding, okay? Your, the citizenship that you have plays a key role to the resources that they are available to you. One very important example for this, uh, from my personal experience, like uh, here in Singapore, we are in a world-class university uh, SMU is one of the best universities in the world in terms of teaching. I have told you this many times and I totally mean it. The, the job that is done here at SMU uh, cannot be matched even from institutions that they are considered like traditionally top of the top. So uh, 
you having access in an institution like that is a tremendous privilege and advantage. And I will give you as an example, the university I worked when I was in Russia, it was one university that in research terms, it was in the same rankings like SMU was, like give or take pretty much in the same rankings. However, in Singapore, there are another couple of universities at the level of SMU. In Russia also, there are another couple of universities at the level of the university I worked before. So you have three similar institutions in one country, three similar institutions in another country, and they pretty much take the same amount of students each one of these uh, three institutions. So what you actually have is, let's say, uh, 30,000 students that they will study per year in top institutions in Singapore, and another 30,000 of students that they will study in those institutions in Russia. But what you actually have is that the population of Singapore is 5.7 million, and the population of Russia is 145 million or something like that. And you see that the students that they have access from the entire student body of the country, potential student body, you have... Uh, 20% of the students they will be able to go to a university at the level of SMU in Singapore, and only 1% of the students in Russia will be able to make it to a top university of uh, uh, their, their choice in, uh, in that country. So this means that if you are here in Singapore and you are not in the top 1% in the admissions, if you were born in Russia, you would not have a chance to study in education level like that. You would go to a college that will give you a degree that would not be appreciated in the market as much as uh, the degree that you will take from here. So this means that 19 out of 20 of you, you would not have the opportunity to be here because you would not make it to the, to the 1%. So your citizenship actually allows you to have different access to the uh, higher education, and especially in a top university that will guarantee that you will have a, a decent future uh, to come and a career in whatever you want to study. So macroeconomics provides a useful conceptual framework to study why such disparities exist. And today, we'll just touch the surface, and from the next lecture, we will start uh, going down to try to see what is actually creating these differences. So today we'll mainly attempt to explain how we measure those differences in the standards of living across countries and in the different opportunities that citizens of those countries have. Let's talk a little bit about GDP per capita. Here's an interesting example. China has a GDP of $13.6 trillion, while Switzerland has a GDP of only $0.7 trillion. So from these numbers, it seems that China is vastly wealthier over Switzerland. Yet, the average Chinese citizen is way poorer than the average Swiss national. What gives there? How can we actually make the comparison if you can see such differences? When we make cross-country comparisons, it makes sense to use variables that they compare the income per individual. So we have to use a per capita measurement. So when you divide the GDP by the country's population, you will get the GDP per capita, which is a much more consistent measurement because it also accounts for the size of the economy, not only for the uh, total resources, but what resources are um, for every person on average. So still, the values are much more comparable now, but they are not directly comparable because there are many other differences, one of which is the currency. So values are counted in different, in different currencies across countries, and we have to convert GDP to the same currency. This is a much harder to do than what it seems because Somebody can be like, okay, so there is a tool to do that. There's a current exchange rate. Just you take the newspaper or you check on Google what is the exchange rate of the Singaporean dollar and the American dollar, and you have real-time information 
Uh, there you go. What, what else do you need? Um, this doesn't work exactly like that. And here's why it doesn't work like that. Because the exchange rate serves currency trading purposes. So the exchange rate is a price that is actually created by the demand and the supply of foreign exchange currency. Okay, so it's not, its purpose It's not to translate values from one currency to the other. Its purpose is to actually create a value for you buying or selling currency. These are very similar, but they also have differences in values. And these differences are a major concern for economists who use a different conversion, not the exchange rate. They use a different conversion for GDP matters. And this conversion is called the PPP, Purchase Power Parity, which brings me to the internal video number seven, which explains exactly how we use two such measures. One is the CPI that we use to compare the GDP from one year to another, and the other one is the PPP, which uh, we use in order to make GDP comparable across nations. So you will watch this video and you will understand exactly what is the nature of the PPP and why we use it instead of the exchange rate. All right, so let's see a little bit the data and to have, uh, the purpose of this is to give you a general perspective, to give you some context. So you will be able to understand what happens in the world in terms of uh, prosperity and which countries are rich, which countries are not, and to understand what are the reasons behind that. First of all, you must have a, a clue about what is going on. So here's a very interesting map. So the redder you are in this map, the poorer you are, the greener, the better. Okay, green is the color of the money, so that's why the greener, the better. And from this map, very quickly, you can see some very uh, important observations. The first one is that wealth tends to cluster. All right, so what do you have here? Western Europe, Northern America, which is just a, you can put a, a circle around it. And then you can continue the circle this side, and then uh, if the Earth is a globe, if it is a globe, uh, then you will come out on that side and you will have also Australia. So you have a cluster of the, those wealthy nations with very few exceptions. Okay, they are so few that you can actually name them. So the first one is uh, right here, which is uh, uh, Japan, Korea, South Korea, and then you can go here, which is uh, Hong Kong, then you can see here that the, uh, the designer of the map went out of their way to make Singapore much bigger than it is to show you that it's like totally dark green here. Okay, then you go here, which are the uh, couple of countries, two, three countries that they just sell uh, resources, Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia, that they're traditionally very rich. And then if you wonder for this exception here, this is not an exception. This is the French... Uh, uh, Guinea, and uh, this is a part of the European Union. It's a poor country, but because it's considered as a, a territory of France, it takes its color from the, from the GDP of France. It's not its own. So that's it. That's it. There are so few countries outside of this cluster that you can actually uh, know, uh, know them by name. And then you will see that if you happen to be here, totally poor, on that side, totally poor, uh, South America, totally poor. Okay, so you see that rich nations and poor nations, they tend to cluster. And this is a very important observation, something that makes sense. So that's why I'm telling you, like, for example, if you are born here, if you are born here, like, you have no escape. You are going to be in poverty. Like, people imagine, uh, uh, sometimes I'm thinking about that. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a thought that makes me really sad. That if, how many geniuses, real geniuses at the level of Einstein or Tesla or uh, Elon Musk or Kim Kardashian, we have lost because they were born here and they were never uh, 
they never got educated. They were never discovered. They never, never came to their full potential. Okay, so you understand that where you live, that what I said before, that your passport actually dictates a lot of your opportunities and a lot of your uh, final outcome in life. And this is something that this map, which is totally about money, okay, this map is an economic map, can show you about real potential of people. Okay, it doesn't matter if you do, uh, if you work in the, uh, in the stock market or if you are an artist or if you are a vlogger, it doesn't matter. If you, if you are here, probably you're going to have a very good luck. Um, if you are here, uh, not so much. So this actually plays a major role in, in society. This is, uh, this is the, one of the most important things that we will talk about in economics and society that concerns the society. So here are some uh, specific countries to give you even more context. It's the 2018 wealth measured in 2005 dollars. And you will see here that uh, the most wealthy country is Luxembourg, then Switzerland, and then Norway. And uh, all these countries here, they are countries that they uh, do something interesting, like for example, uh, Luxembourg and uh, Switzerland. Luxembourg is a tax haven, so collects a lot of money there, but the real income in Luxembourg for uh, for the people that they live there is not that high. You have so high income because you have several, so much money that comes there, is taxed there, but then leaves for other destinations because simply it's a tax, ha uh, tax haven. And then you can see that this is another flow of measurement of GDP. Luxembourg appears to do perfect, but it's not actually all of this its own wealth. All right, then you have Switzerland, which um, uh, doesn't do this exactly the same because Switzerland offers a lot of banking services. Money goes to Switzerland because the banking services there, they are uh, extremely sophisticated and, and work very well and they are extremely safe and for all these reasons that you probably have heard before, but also offers, like this is part of the production of Switzerland. Uh, money doesn't go to Switzerland because taxes are low. It goes there because people trust the banking system and uh, it works well for them. Then you have Norway, which is one of the countries that repeatedly appears as the wealthiest country in terms of uh, what uh, your money can buy you. So it's one of the countries that is uh, considered now, if you like the cold climate, which personally I'm not a big fan of, this is, this is a, a heaven country to live in that they have solved a lot of problems that other big countries like the US, they have failed to solve, like for example, healthcare, education, and all, and all this. Uh, and then you have Ireland, which appears there. And Ireland appears there for uh, not so much for reasons that they have to do with Ireland itself. They have to do that a lot of corporations, for some tax reasons, they select to be headquartered in Ireland because the legal system and the tax system in Ireland is um, um, very specific, as especially the ones of you that you will go uh, to the accounting uh, uh, major, you will see that Ireland is something that uh, it's, it's a very friendly country to have headquarters of big corporations. Even uh, the headquarters of uh, Apple, they are in Ireland. And uh, you will see that they have a, a huge uh, GDP that is not, like the average person in Ireland, they are not really wealthy. I would say that they are, uh, in some cases, they are at the same level of wealth with Greece, but because you have so much, so much uh, huge corporations that they concentrate a lot of income there, you see that income appears to be higher. So that's why uh, I don't have it in green. Then you have Qatar that sells uh, mainly oil, so natural resources, and that's why it's, uh, it's so high. Uh, Singapore, which is amazing. And then you have uh, USA, Australia, and Germany, uh, three traditionally strong economies. Uh, Germany, for example, uh, all the engineering and industrial goods that they come from there, they have a very good reputation. They are much more expensive. As a country, has uh, significant market power. Uh, even I see, like I saw an advertisement uh, uh, a couple of days before on a on a printed on a bus in Singapore, and I, I don't remember what they were selling. I think I think they were selling something. They were advertising something that had to do with uh, disinfecting or something like that. And it had a, had a big German flag. Like this is a German product. Which if you say that 
I don't know why, but if you say that if something is a German product, you automatically, everybody thinks, oh, then it means it's a good product. And let's go now to the outside, which is the not so rich kids. And you can see, for example, my uh, country, Greece, with an uh, average income of $20,400. Uh, as I told you before, this income is 35% less than 12 years ago. So it used to be around 30, a little less than 30 back then. And now it's uh, 20.4. So still, I want you to notice in this table that Greece is, in terms of ranking, in position 39. So it has only 38 countries that they are wealthier than it. And then it has uh, another 164 countries that they are below it. And this is something that we will discuss a little later also, but I want you to observe it now. And look at these uh, super important and strong countries, uh, Russia, China, Turkey, Iran, and India, that as a country, all of them, they are very influential. All of them, they're considered very important military powers. But on the income side of things, they are poor countries. Like a, a Russian makes like half of how much a Greek makes after a, a devastating crisis. Okay, a, a Turkish person makes even less. So we see here that power and influence, they are not exactly, they have to do mostly with your size, not with the income per capita. And this is another interesting information that you can get from this table. Next, I want to show you the distribution of income among countries. So let's see this very interesting chart. On the horizontal axis, I have income beans. So here is if you are extremely poor, below $1,000 per year, here between one and 2,000, here between two and 5,000, five to 10,000, and then we go up by 10,000 beans. All right, so you should expect that poor countries will be on the left and rich countries will be on the right. And on the vertical axis, I have the number of countries that they are in this particular bin. Here you can see that we have uh, 19 countries that they are extremely poor. And this is, uh, let's say, the, the bunch of poor countries that they are in this side of the graph. Then you have some countries that I would call them like the middle class of countries. And uh, you have a mass of countries right there. Uh, for example, Brazil, China, and South Africa, they are in this uh, low middle class. Then Argentina, Mexico, Russia, uh, among others, they are in the middle of the middle class. And then uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, South Korea, they are in the, in the high middle class. And then you have the rich countries here, uh, France, Germany, and Ireland, even richer Australia, Kuwait, uh, USA, and the most rich of countries, Luxembourg, uh, Singapore, United Arab Emirates, Qatar. So you see that, first of all, the rich are not that many. Okay, so you have like here, uh, maybe 16 countries that they are between 30 and 40,000. And then you have four between 40 and 50. And you have exactly five that they make above 50. Okay, and again, this is in 2005 PPP dollars now. So we can compare among nations much more effectively. Before I go on, I want you to focus a little bit on Greece. Not because it's my country, but it's a country that has to show us a lot of context of what is going on with income in every country. How do you compare the income? So Greece, after so many years of crisis, it's still in the upper middle class of countries, if we can call it that. So it's in this part of the chart. And I want you to see that how few countries they can claim that they are wealthier than this devastated from the crisis country. Very few countries are better off. And then how huge of a mass of countries is still way poorer in the debate in the American elections when uh, the two candidates, they want to talk about national debt, they always bring Greece up. Like this is an example of what happens to countries that they have a lot of debt. But still you can see here that we are talking about this situation. I told you before my personal experience from the crisis and everything, but you can still see that when we are talking about 
uh, about such a crisis, we are not talking about the situation that you are here, Greece was there before, that you were here and then you go back here. Okay, we're not talking about total bankruptcy and stuff like that. Okay, so you can understand from this graph to have a, a, a total perspective, a, a point of view to see that, okay, so here's what happens from a crisis. You go from here to there. Of course, this means that you lose one third of your income. This is pretty bad, but it's not like uh, if you go to Greece now and you just visit for a week, maybe you will not even be able to understand that there is a crisis. You, as a spectator, that you do not know the country, you are not going to see everybody being on the street like, please give me some money to eat. It's not like that. People lost a lot of income, but still the country can stand at that point right here. So in this graph, there is a great amount of variation uh, from very, very poor to very, very rich countries. And we have to understand why this happens. So let me keep the graph in that screen. And I want to go and try to understand what happens and gives me this variation. So first of all, this is GDP per capita. And maybe the division of the GDP over the population, maybe this is the reason of the variation. So instead of dividing by the population, maybe I should divide by something else. Because population includes children, the elderly, and also people that they are unemployed because they cannot find a job. Or maybe some people, they do not want to find a job. So these groups are known as the non-workforce population. So you have the workforce, and you have some people that by choice or by uh, uh, the, their situation, they are not able to be in the labor force, so they are, all of them, they are non-labor force population. Also, in some countries, you may actually have a more free choice than in others if you want to be in the non-labor force population or in the labor force population. So because of social nets or even for social reasons, you might have very different sizes of proportions, let's say, of the population that they are labor force or non-labor force. What are those? For example, maternity, illness, retraining, homemaking, social norms, and stuff like that. Like for example, in Russia, you will see that if a woman gets pregnant, then she has three years of her work uh, that she can actually go home and stay with her kids till they get to an age that they can go to the kindergarten. Okay, this is like a significant amount of maternity leave. In Greece, if you work for the public sector, this is up to a year. Uh, and most people, they actually take the entire year. In the United States, it's five weeks. Okay, so you see that in many different countries, like the social norms, they are very different. Uh, like, for example, if you uh, ever fall ill and you cannot work on, or you choose to not work because of your situation, sometimes uh, you have uh, health issues that they can be faced during going to work or even better, not going to work for this time. Uh, in some countries, this is much easier than in others. Like, for example, in Scandinavia that we talked about before, Norway, Finland, Sweden, this is extremely easy to take an extended leave of your job just because you, uh, you have to take care of your health. In some other countries, it's not easy at all. Uh, retraining, for example, we have a lot of countries that they even incentivize people to stop working and to go back to school to change their careers to something more productive uh, in, uh, for the economy later. And uh, finally, you have very, uh, very interesting and important differences in the homemaking social norms. Like, for example, in some economies, it's uh, uh, considered given that the wife must work. It's like common sense that the women must work. In some other countries, not that much. And uh, these are no, I'm not talking here about like third world countries or stuff like that. I'm even talking about uh, societies that they're considered advanced. And uh, I recently watched an old episode of The Simpsons uh, today in the United States, you cannot produce such an episode, uh, in which uh, Homer's wife wants to go back to work, and she does go back to work, and Homer doesn't think that, 
oh, she goes back to work and she's going to be creative. She will do something. I mean, she works at a, uh, because it's a, it's a comic series. So it, uh, she works in a fast food uh, serving French fries on rollers. And, but he doesn't think, oh, she will have her own money. She will have her own independency. She will have her own creativity to how she wants to do her work and everything like that. Instead of that, he thinks that, oh, it's my failure that I cannot provide enough for my family, so my wife has to work. So he sees that as his, his personal uh, failure. So this shows you that even in the United States, the, the uh, homemaking mentality uh, for women or for anybody else is, is much different than in other countries. Like, for example, in Greece, it's unheard of to be a student and to also have a job. In the United States, sometimes you can have a real job when you are 16, 17 years old. Like, I mean, a real job, like a legal, normal job, not like washing your dad's car for $20 like uh, kids do in Greece, but you can actually have a, a job that is, you're actually registered in the, for, as a labor service uh, person in this case. All right, so you can see that we have the safety nets and social reasons. So maybe the difference is because of that. All this uh, variation that you can see in that, in that side of the, of the screen is because of this uh, situation here. So our cross-country GDP variations because of differences in the non-labor force population. So to test for this possibility, we can compare these uh, variations with respect to GDP, not per capita, but per worker. So instead of dividing the GDP for the entire population, let's divide it by those who produce it. Who are the workers? So GDP per worker is a better measure for uh, productivity. We will talk about productivity a lot, but I want to show you how this uh, chart will change if we actually put here the productivity per worker now, the uh, GDP per worker. So it's exactly the same. Of course, the numbers now will be uh, higher because the GDP per worker will be higher than the GDP per uh, capita because you divide by less people. So here we have the poorer countries like Congo, Burundi, Eritrea, Malawi, Niger, Afghanistan, and then some of the middle-class countries like Pakistan, India, Brazil, China, Morocco, Mexico, Argentina, Russia, and the richer countries now. And as you can see here, uh, something interesting, if you leave out the non-working population, you will see that some countries, they jump up. Like for example, look where Germany and France went now in the almost top tier countries, and even Greece moved in the uh, lower high class now instead of the upper middle class that it was before. And uh, you can see here that why this happened, because those countries, they actually have a lot of non-labor population that uh, is something that doesn't really tell you much about the income, but it tells you uh, more about the level of happiness in this country in the sense that, okay, so it's, it is happiness if you can give one year to a mother to uh, spend some time and to bond with her kid, a uh, newborn kid. And it, it's a part of happiness. Instead of being in, at work and producing material wealth, this is a part of happiness. So this is a measurement that actually leaves out that and shows you, okay, so for those who are just produce, what is the average level of productivity there? The average, uh, how much each worker produces? If you look at the two graphs together, you're going to realize that the differences in the two graphs, they are not that vast. They are not that important. So you will not see that a country is here in terms of GDP uh, per capita, and then when you do GDP per worker, it will go all the way there. Uh, the, the graphs are pretty similar to each other. They just show you that countries that they have uh, safety nets and they have uh, access to, uh, to, uh, to better health uh, and social services, they tend to appear to have a ranking in GDP per worker much higher than GDP per capita because simply you have much more uh, of a portion of the population that is not in the labor force. All right, so let's talk about productivity now. Productivity is the main reason why income per country varies. We see that even if you 
leave the non-labor force population out, you see, observe a vast difference from how much, for example, the average German produces and how much the average Argentinian produces. So you see that there are these differences still if you leave out all the safety nets and the social norms. So productivity is the value of goods and services a worker produces per hour of work. And this actually is a very similar definition to GDP per worker, uh, which GDP per worker is the amount of production by the average uh, citizen in the country that is in the labor force. To understand the huge differences in productivity across these countries, uh, what we must consider is the production side of the economy. This would be uh, the way to go if we want to understand the differences in the chart that we saw before. So they all boil down to productivity, and productivity is something that belongs in the production process of the country. So we need to study the factors that they make the labor much more productive in one country than in other countries. Now, before we go on, you have to understand here that we are going to focus in the production side, but we are going to see it from the human side. We are not going to see it as a process like we did in microeconomics. That's a, a major difference. So here we are very interested in the productivity of labor, because you can actually define the productivity of capital. Okay, productivity of capital is how much per dollar of capital is actually produced from the production process. So you can actually define productivity for capital, for labor, for uh, many other things. But here we are interested in the productivity of labor because we focus on the macro side of the economy and the citizens that they live in the country, they're actually, they have a, a labor side, they're, they're workers. We don't care about the prosperity of machines. We care about the prosperity of workers, as you understand. So we're going to focus on labor. So there are three factors that I want to cover that they affect the productivity of labor. The first factor is the human capital. The human capital is very important. Workers differ in terms of human capital, which is uh, their stock of skills to produce output. So for example, an economist that graduated from SMU will be able to produce much higher output than somebody who graduated from just high school and just went and worked at a bank. Okay, so you will not have the same quality of human capital from one person and another. And if one reason you are here, and I keep telling you that, you are not here to get a degree. You are here to get a knowledge. The degree is just a proof that you have the knowledge. So do not forget to get the knowledge with your degree, because the degree is going to make a difference in the very beginning in your career, but in your life, the knowledge is going to make the difference, the know-how. So your professors here, they are eager to give you the know-how, and you have to be eager to take it also. Do not just take the degree, and that's all you do in your student life. So a highly trained worker can do actually two things can either produce higher quantity of output, like for example, you have a highly trained banker that can use uh, Excel very proficiently and understands all the uh, accounting tricks and all the, uh, all the methods that you can do the math. And for example, instead of doing multiplications from line to line, you can do multiplications from an entire spreadsheet to another if your brain is able enough to, to capture the, uh, how these things should work at a much more massive level, you could be able to produce much more output than somebody who's just uh, going to the one cell of Excel and says, okay, this cell, and then I click to that plus, and then I click to another cell, somebody can actually add two spreadsheets together like in, a, in 10 seconds, okay? So one person does 10 calculations in a, in a minute, the other person does 10,000 calculations in a minute. So you can see here that uh, a highly trained worker can actually produce much more. And secondly, some jobs can simply not be done by not highly trained workers. Like for example, it's not that a uh, untrained person can do fewer heart operations than a uh, highly trained doctor. 
Okay, it's not, the, the difference there is not the, the quantity of operations. Uh, the difference is that the doctor can do operations and the other person better should not do operations. Okay, so either you do more or you can do quality, you can create quality of output that the unskilled workers cannot produce. Okay, so the human capital stock of an economy is the result of investment in education. So if we are here now and I am uh, a gazillion miles away from my country and I work here, and I was interviewed and hired from uh, another different place in, in, uh, in the US, in Atlanta, uh, several uh, uh, years ago. And uh, I, was, I, I came to work here and we have people from Italy, people from Korea, people from all over the place, we brought them here. Uh, we, the, the, the people of the university that they hired us here, they have one basic thing in their mind, how they are going to create human capital stock for the economy. So they invest in this, like my salary is actually an investment from the Singaporean government that they want their human capital to go to the next level so they can keep growing. Because especially if you have a country that is in the high class of growth already, it's, it's a wealthy country, if you want to push the envelope and go to the next level, your only way to do it is if you train your employees to become better. And again, that's why we are telling you, do not just get the grade and the paper, just get the knowledge. The knowledge is the most important. The knowledge is going to make you the highly skilled person that you will be able to take your country and take it to, to another level. Even if you are from Singapore or you just study Singapore, it's the same thing. The knowledge is what is going to help you and the entire economy to become better. The second part is the physical capital. Physical capital is the, what we refer to as capital, the equipment. Okay, uh, machines, equipment, software, buildings, and any kind of infrastructure that is, uh, has to do with uh, non-human labor. So all this is capital and this actually affects aggregate production. It will depend on the amount of physical capital and infrastructure. So in macro, the non-human capital, the physical capital, we see it as a means that they enable the workers, the labor, the population, in other words, to produce output and to be more productive. Okay, so the physical capital enables the human capital to be more productive. This is uh, an important thing that I want you to, to understand, as I said before, we focus on the labor as a production factor, not on the physical capital. So the physical capital actually enables the labor to be more productive. Okay, this is the message here. So either if you are skilled or unskilled, you will be more productive if the economy can offer to you a larger or better physical capital stock. If you have better equipment, you will work better. Like for example, last year that I was filming for my lectures, I had uh, uh, one little camcorder that I had bought for $150 uh, a few years ago. And the problem with this is that I had to film like double the time because half of the time it would not focus very well. So I could not do my job. When I was working back in Russia, we, uh, I was uh, teaching in the biggest auditorium because I was teaching a class with uh, 350 people, and we had a massively big screen with a very, very small projector. And the projector was so weak that if it was a sunny day, I could not do my job and teach the students what I had to teach them because they could not see uh, the projector in the sunny days. Of course, uh, the good thing was that the sunny days in Russia, they are usually two or three every year. So it was not a big problem, but if it was a little bit of light outside, uh, the university did not want to invest in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, these shutters that they closed the windows. They didn't want to invest in a better projector because it was expensive. And this actually had the result that I could not do my job. All my slides were black and white because if you had the color like yellow or something like that, uh, the students could not see it in the projector. So I could not actually transmit the information that I wanted. The projector was very slow and I could not do all these animations. 
So I came here at uh, SMU, and the first thing that I looked when I took a look at the classes is that if they have working projectors. And I saw that they had these amazing uh, projectors that uh, you could actually do a lot of things with them. And they had two in every room. Like, can you believe that? Like, it's amazing. And then uh, after some time, they told me, I saw them that they were changing the projectors. And I was like, what are you guys doing? Why are you taking the projectors out? And, I, you know, I have a thing with projectors. And they were like, no, no, we put better ones. Like, even better ones, seriously. So now we have these amazing projectors that they can actually show on the camera. You can show the animations to the students. And uh, it makes a huge difference. If I show you a graph, like, there you go, a final graph with all these lines, you will not be able to understand what is going on. But if, you, if I show it to you in an animation, line after every line, like in the same way that you will draw it in your notebook, this will make my job much easier and the knowledge much more eff effectively transmitted from me to you and actually makes me more productive. So this is not just to be fancy and to show you that I can do uh, good animations, which I can. Uh, it's also because it makes the teaching process more productive. So I can produce more output. Why? Because the equipment allows me, enables me to be more productive. And the third and final reason for differences in productivity is technology. I want to remind you the definition of technology that we used in the beginning of the course, because people tend to confuse it from how we use the term in, the, uh, in everyday life. So people consider that technology is artificial intelligence and drones and robots and uh, uh, microchips and all this stuff. But actually, technology is nothing more than an efficient way of combining labor and capital in order to do the job faster, cheaper, or easier. That's pretty much what technology is. And we had used this example where we had this uh, uh, primitive technology where you have a rock and you put it on three sticks and then you put a carrot on the bottom and then the rabbit will go to eat the carrot and will move one of the, of the sticks because it's very excited that it found food. And then the rabbit will become food, which is very good for the villagers that they will be able to put food on the table. Very bad for the rabbit, but that's another story. Uh, poor rabbit. But uh, this is technology because you found this way and now instead of needing like three men to, to be hunters. You just need one smart man who will just set the traps and this is actually what is going to create the output. So instead of needing three workers, now you need only one worker to produce the same amount of output or even more output. This is a technological advancement. It doesn't have to involve electricity or software or stuff like that. So an economy with better technology uses its labor and capital more efficiently and therefore can achieve higher productivity. Because if you produce, let's say, three rabbits from three hunters that they go with, uh, uh, with weapons and they try to catch, the, to catch the rabbit, and you produce three rabbits by one guy who sets three different traps and actually can catch three rabbits also this way. So you have like the productivity of the hunters will be one, one rabbit per hunter. The productivity of the a uh, guy who puts the traps will be three because he has three rabbits for one man. So you see there that this, uh, the technology can lead to differences in productivity. An economy can have better technology in two ways. The first is either because of superior knowledge about the production process. So most of the time technology is related to intellectual property. Technology is intellectual property. Is the method of doing something in a more efficient way, requiring less inputs per unit of output. This is what um, we were saying before in terms of rabbits and men that they hunt the rabbit. So this is something that uh, actually can work with better knowledge. So you have better technology in this case if you know how to make the trap, exact way that the trap will be more effective, if you know where to put the traps, if you know what to put as a bait for the traps, if you know uh, when to, to set the traps and, and when to come back and catch the rabbits. So these are all parts of just information that becomes technology. And again, it is a, a form of intellectual capital there. So this is one way. The second way is because of superior organization. Sometimes 
You may have the ideas, you may have the way to combine things, but you fail in the organization of doing that. This part of technology is something that a lot of countries have problem with, and this has to do with the work ethic that exists in this country, and also the corruption levels and how accustomed uh, different nations are to corruption practices. So I remember when I was teaching in Russia, I was in this university that uh, its basic goal was research excellence, to climb the research rankings in the, in the world rankings. But teaching was also a concern. Like several of us, we wanted support in our teaching and uh, we needed at least that there exists a department that they will, they will support us. So they put together a department and the director selected a particular guy to, uh, to lead the department. And this person was one that we had always discussing in the faculty meetings about his performance regarding the, the teaching. So, I'm talking about the situation here that the best evaluation that this guy had, the best, not the worst, was like, ah, oh, don't take me wrong, he's a horrible teacher, his material is barely readable and so boring, but at least he's a good person. That was the, the best evaluation he had. And we were stunned when the director chose him to actually be the head of the teaching uh, support of the university because uh, he knew nothing about teaching. Uh, but then when I asked around, uh, people were like, oh, here is Russia. We do things in a different way. So this guy is probably the most trustworthy, according to the director, uh, one that is the least likely to cause problems to him, one that is the least likely to ask things that they are uh, not easy to deliver and all this. Uh, so he, it was a convenient choice. It was not a choice that will indeed make the department better. It was a choice that was convenient for the, for the director. And uh, as you understand, this is something that existed in the entire economy. Nobody was really, uh, felt really strange about it. Nobody felt that. No, everybody was like, yeah, sure, that sounds normal. Uh, because, uh, you know, in some economies, things are like that. So we will select a person to be the manager and this person has to be the person who belongs to the same political party or somebody who is relative or somebody who is uh, our friend or somebody who we trust or somebody who is the least dangerous person for our leadership or somebody who the uh, government actually sends us uh, because, you know, he's the kid of somebody who has influence and stuff like that. So all these will actually affect the combination and the performance of the production from the workers. So the workers need leadership in order to work. And this, actually, I put it under technology because it has to do with coordination of production factors and it will affect the productivity of workers. So in today's lecture, the basic goal is to set the groundwork in order to understand what we are going to deal with in the future. So we'll talk about the short-term fluctuations in the economy. We will talk about the long-run growth of the economy. We'll talk about crisis. We'll talk about unemployment, the labor market, the money market, the functions of money, and many other different things. This is the end for today. I hope you liked the lecture. If you, uh, if you uh, like it, uh, put a like there, like YouTubers do, uh, like and subscribe and stuff like that. Uh, uh, I mean, yes, do like it because it took me seven hours to film that. It was, uh, uh, it was day when I started and now it's pitch black outside. Also, if you have a question, I would be glad to see it down in the comments and also to answer it. And my TAs will be very happy to go and give you an answer if they, uh, they make it there before me, but I will also check. So uh, thank you very much for being with me today and watching, and I will see you next time.